So we will open our meeting. It is 7.02. This is the meeting of the City of Sandy Planning Commission. This is Monday, November the 23rd, 2020. This meeting is being conducted um, electronically using Zoom video conference platform. We'll give instructions uh, in a little bit as to how, uh, how guests and public can participate. Let's begin with a roll call. Okay, um, I'm actually not gonna be taking minutes tonight. Uh, Emily is going to be taking them. So that'll be one less thing I'm doing during the meeting. So I should be able to respond a little sooner um, to both questions and roll calls or motions. So I just wanted to let you know. Thanks. Good. Commissioner Carlton. Present. Commissioner Losowski. Here. Commissioner McLean Wenzel. Uh, Commissioner Logan is excused due to other obligations. Commissioner Mobley. Here. Commissioner Mayton. Here. And Chairman Crosby. Here. Okay, we had in our packets the meeting, the minutes from the meeting of our last month, October 26, 2020. For those of you that were there, I was not. Um, any corrections, changes, things that you noted? Well, the, the only one is the one that uh, Kelly already mentioned. He he put your signature at the end, and it man, it needs to be mine. So I'm sure you'll do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we can just take Aaron, a mine, mine was rather small. I was just going to say this is kind of more for my own humor. Is to add an exclamation point at the end of my sentence that said, Commissioner Mayton uh, asked the public to apply for commissioner because we had a period and we only had one at that time, so. So noted. Okay, we'll take a motion. I move we accept the minutes as presented with the corrections noted. I second it been moved and seconded to correct, uh, to accept the minutes of uh, 26 October, 2020 as uh, corrected. All in favor, say aye or wa wave your hand. Aye. Aye. Okay, and I will call myself as an, ex an extension, abstention because I was not there. So the motion passes. Okay, this is the time on our agenda each of our, in every one of our meetings where we give opportunity for anybody uh, in the public to speak to the Planning Commission on an, an item that is not on tonight's agenda. Um, <clears throat> if you are participating online through Zoom, uh, you click the raised hand icon button and then wait to be recognized. Uh, if you're on telephone, dial star nine. That will effectively raise your hand and then wait to be recognized. So we'll give opportunity for general public comment on something or things that are not on tonight's agenda. Chairman, I don't, I don't see any hands raised. Okay. And we'll move on to the director's report and turn it over to you, Kelly. Yeah, I didn't have much. I mean, I was just gonna let you know that um, depending on the outcome of this evening, we may or may not have a December meeting. Uh, Chairman Crosby and I have talked about it and we'd like to give the commission the month off if at all possible. Uh, we currently don't have anything slated for that meeting. Um, and then on the first meeting in January, we will have three hearings, one of which will be the House bill, one of which will be Rogue Fabrication Zone Change, and the other one will be the Sandy High School Field House, which is the batting cages by the high school. They're seeking some deviations to the design standards. Um, just a couple other notes. 
in two weeks, Chairman Crosby, three city councilors, and myself will be meeting with four candidates for the three planning commissioner seats. So current Commissioner Mayton and three other people that also turned in applications for the seats. Um, so that will be coming up here. I think it's the first week of December that we're meeting with them. And then we're hoping to have those new commissioners, whoever is selected, appointed to the commission in December by the city council. So that in our first meeting in January, we'll be up and running with a full seven uh, member commission once again. And then at that meeting in January, we'll hopefully appoint the chair and vice chair like we typically do in January as well. Um, other than that, that's pretty much my update. I, I did include a little staff report, which is about a page long. Um, as I told you last month, these will just basically have the most pertinent upcoming applications and just different information that I, that I find the most pertinent and interesting for you guys to hear. Um, in the future, when we have new commercial projects or apartments or subdivisions that are starting to be constructed, I'll also sometimes include updates on those in here or when we have new subdivisions or partitions that their plats are recorded, I'll also give you notice on that. So with that, that's all I had tonight, unless anybody has any questions for me. Um, I, had, I had two quick ones and this is just information. Um, I saw something in one of your past uh, communications that had to do with um, the, the veterinary clinic. I noticed their, their pickup's been parked there on one of the commercial lots for now a couple of months. Uh, are they planning on building on a, that vacant lot site or is there something in front of you that you guys are reviewing? Yeah, nothing in front of us. Um, I do know that Shan Hill or Sean Hill um, the man that owns Barlow Trail Veterinary Clinic, he purchased that site and I believe intends to build a new veterinary clinic there. We had a pre-app on it. Um, since he's purchased it, he's done some basic shrub clearing. And then I think he also pumped and filled the cesspool that was on there. That was about 30 feet deep. So if anybody noticed, there's like a large metal plate on that the last few years. And that's because under that plate was a 30 foot hole with water in it. <laughs> um, it was actually directly under that old yellow house that sat on that property and nobody knew about it until we actually demoed the house. <laughs> so he has, I think, filled that. I think there's a couple feet of fill that's still needed there, but he has done that. And then I believe he's working with an architect and an engineer to put together a submittal for us to review. So that's as much as I know for the time being. Oh, well, it'd be nice to see something there. Um, there's other, um, one other thing I noticed was, um, um, you know, um, there where the accountant kind of used to be in that building this uh, just back up from the library, they were doing some work and there was what kind of a sign out there that said it was like going to be a medical clinic or something, or is there something going on at, there that you're aware of or does that ring a bell? Uh, which building is that? Well, you guys have names for buildings, and I don't, you know, um, I, I don't, I don't really know, but um, it's on, it's on uh, west, you know, it's going westbound, and uh, there was um, like a tax consultant, or uh, it oh. was in there, it was, so, then you said it was going out of business. So this is between um, the gun, the gun store and uh, Ria's bar? Yeah. Building? Yeah, right in there. And it just said it was like a medical clinic or something. Yeah, I, th I think it is going to be some sort of medical clinic. I don't, you know, it doesn't trigger any land use action. And I think it's going to trigger some small um, trade permits like plumbing, electrical, and mechanical. But other than that, I think it's just going to be that and then a, a business license. But I don't really know exactly what's going in there. I think it is a medical office. Okay, thanks. Kelly, I just wanted to um, thank you for the, you know, that active land use applications matrix that you put on the website. I find that to be really helpful. Yeah, most of that I have to give credit you know to. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were done talking. Okay. Um, yeah, that's Diane. mainly, yeah, that's mainly Jeff Aprati and Rebecca uh, Casey that do all the work on that. I 
barely do anything on that. So I, I don't want to take the credit. Yeah, it's, it's a really good matrix that we used to just have in PDF format. Now they've made it more of a dynamic uh, page. And at some point, we will even have a map. So right now, there's a static map that's a PDF map and a static matrix, which is more dynamic than the previous matrix, which is just PDF. Um, but in the near future, we are working on a program that will actually even tie it in better so that the map will be even more integrated into the matrix. So I think that might be launched in the next two to six months. I don't know the exact timing on it, but I anticipate that it will only get better over time. Goodbye. Well, thank you for doing it because it's, um, it's really nice to be able to see it right there in front of me easily. Thank you. Thanks for the feedback. We can uh, move into the, the next thing, just the commissioner's discussion. If there's any particular um, issue that uh, is burning on your mind that you want to um, float, discuss a bit before we move into the public hearing, we'll do um, it. Do I just it had a question. We're alert. I just had a question kind of for Kelly. Um, you know, it sounds like we will have some new folks in January and uh, three public hearings for the first one sounds like it's going to be uh, immersion. Um, it's how the plan is for, you know, getting those people kind of some up to speed or training or do you guys have anything you're thinking of or? Yeah, historically, we usually send them this little yellow book that you've probably looked at. And then I'm also going to send them some information from Barry Elsner and Hammond that they've put together over the years on how uh, some different legal things, um, including clear and objective standards, needed housing, stuff like that, that have been very prevalent in the last few years. In addition to that, we actually are working with Morgan's CPS group, which is out of Kaiser, Oregon. And he might uh, be doing a training in hopefully late winter or early spring. And he does these trainings through his company called the Chinook Institute. Um, but instead of having people go to him or people doing it all online, we're actually, Jordan and I are looking into hiring him to give a training to council and to the planning commission. So I'm glad you brought that up, Don, because I was going to mention it in January. Um, we're looking at dates in February and March right now. So if you have any dates that absolutely will not work, if you could send me those, that would be great. Um, I think it will be one of these deals that I think they're looking at probably a night that's typically a council meeting or an alternative Monday night. So it could be like the second Monday of the month in February or March. And that will be a training opportunity for all the planning commissioners, both the current and new planning commissioners and the current and new city councilors to all come and attend. Um, I think it's long overdue and I think it's just something that you know, I know quite a bit about planning, but I'm not a trainer. I'm, you know, I told Jordan I'm not the right one to be training people on planning. I just don't have any background in that. Um, so we wanted to hire a professional that that's what they do for a living is train people in land use planning. So that's what we're likely going to be doing in the first half of 2021. So yeah, we, we do recognize that there's a big uh, learning curve when it comes to land use planning in Oregon. So we're trying to prepare for that. One thing, I, one thing I will point out is the hearings in January on the January Planning Commission meeting will be kind of easier ones. It won't be like a huge land use decision process like what we're going through tonight or like the Bull Run Terrace. Mm -hmm. So it, they are smaller. Um, and I think even a few of them will have pretty short staff reports. So I'm hoping to use that meeting as not only a time to look at multiple different land use applications, but also for them, the new commissioners to experience kind of a variety of smaller different projects at the same time. Well, just one thought, maybe we might might consider starting early, like at six or 6.30 and, and just kind of have a work session or we get acquainted, we can talk to them and you get to know us a little bit and maybe just, just as opposed to uh, starting cold turkey at seven, just a thought. Yeah, Jer Jerry and I can certainly talk about that more um, outside of the meeting. That's a good idea. 
Any other thought or issue anybody wants to uh, bring up? Okay. Well, we will move on to new business. We have one public hearing tonight and I will open that public hearing at 717. This is file 20-028 called The Views. And again, as I said before, this, um, this meeting is uh, being conducted by Zoom. And uh, when it comes time for public testimony, I will again give instructions on how to do that. So first though, we wanna call for any abstentions from the hearing body. Okay, nothing seen or heard. Any conflicts of interest to declare? I should, I think um, I should bring up one that I don't consider to be a conflict of interest, but just for the public and for the other commissioners that are out there, Brad Picking, who owns um, one of the parcels that's be in question tonight. Um, he and I are good friends. Um, we made a point of knowing that me being on the planning commission, him owning that, of actually not talking about it and staying away from it. But also, he's not the developer. He is just the one that's looking, as I understand it, to potentially sell the property. So I just spoke to Kelly on this. I'm not, am I missing anything, Kelly? Um, I don't believe so. I don't. Chris Crean, our attorney, is on the line. If you want any input from him, uh, Mr. Crean, can you? There you go. Yeah, um, Commissioner Lasowski, do you have any? Is there any reason to believe you can uh, or you can't be impartial, or that, that you can't be objective and just review the evidence on and measure that against the criteria in the in the staff report? No, no reason. Okay, then then I'm not concerned about bias. Okay. And I think too, in the true sense of conflict of interest, you don't stand to gain anything monetarily right. um, through the public, through the hearing the plan action before us tonight. So. Correct. And, and what I heard you say was you guys have not been talking about this consciously, intentionally. So there's no uh, ex parte communication either. So Correct. I think we're good. I think we're good. He still has to pay for his meals. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any ex parte contact, including any site visits? Okay, nothing seen. All right, I'll call for any challenges to members of the Planning Commission. Again, if you um, want to participate and you're online, uh, click that uh, raise hand button and wait to be recognized. If you're on the telephone, uh, dial star nine to raise your hand and wait to be recognized. So we call for any challenges to any member or members of the Planning Commission. I do have one hand raised. Um, unfortunately, it was raised, I don't know when it was raised. It's been raised for at least a couple minutes now. So I will let that person speak because it was before you asked for challenges, but um, the hand's been raised and you've asked for challenges. So I'm going to allow them to talk. It's John Andrade, I think is how you pronounce his name. Andrade. Go ahead, John. Did you have a comment, John, a uh, challenge to anybody? Are you there, John? Mike, I'm looking at the thing. It looked like it says his mic might be muted. There, no. now, now it's there. unmuted. He might not have a mic. Okay. All right, well, we're gonna move on. If you testify tonight, you must raise all issues you wish to address at this hearing. 
If your issue is not raised at this hearing, you may not be able to raise it later in any appeal. Although I will interject that our decision tonight is really a recommendation to city council. There would be another public hearing on this matter uh, before city council. Your comments should state why the application should or should not be approved or include your proposed modifications you believe are necessary for approval according to the standards. If you do not raise specific issues at the final evidentiary hearing or by close of the record, or fail to provide statements or evidence to allow the local government or its designee to respond to the issue, you will not be able to appeal the decision to the Land Use Board of Appeals based on that particular issue. Any party may request that the hearing be continued to a later date or that the record remain open after the hearing is closed. Failure of the applicant to raise constitutional or other issues relating to this to the proposed conditions of approval with sufficient specificity to allow the local government or its designee to respond to the issue precludes an action for damages in circuit court. Staff report. So before you go to the staff report, Shelley, um, John has raised his hand again. So I'm gonna allow him to speak one more time, try to speak one more time here. Um, if it doesn't happen, we're going to ask you that you please do not raise your hand again because it's your microphone. So I'm going to ask him, allow him to talk here again. Okay, John. Does anybody know who this person is? Um, he's one of the owners that's in that area. He wrote um, a comment. What you yeah. might do is suggest that he call in and just use the phone. Well, I mean, that there, he can do that. There's instructions to do that. I'm assuming he can hear us. Well, what I'm going to do is mute him and he, he can, John, if you can hear us, you can call in during the public testimony piece of the hearing. There'll be an opportunity to speak in favor, against, or neutral. So that will be your time to speak. Um, in the meantime, if you can look at the instructions on the website or in the link, um, I will also try to email you if I can find your email address, but you can try to talk at that time, but we're gonna move on. Okay, thank you. Okay, Shelly, the floor is yours. Okay, great, let me share my screen. So tonight we're talking about um, a proposed plan development called The Views. Um, it's located on the eastern edge of Highway 26 um, on either side of Vista Loop Drive. Um, the site is about 32.87 acres. Um, it's currently zoned as uh, SFR, single family residential. Um, it's the area outlined in red. Um, I probably should have used a different color because it kind of bleeds into the um, the uh, commercial, but um, the entire um, site is single family residential. Um, on the comprehensive plan map, it's designated as low density residential. Um, the site is outlined in green. Uh, that blue triangle right there uh, denotes a um, viewpoint of Mount Hood. So the applicant is requesting a few things, um, a plan development, a zone map amendment, subdivision, a couple of special variances, um, FSH overlay and tree removal. Um, we're gonna be talking about the PD, the zone map amendment and the special variances. So first I wanted to give a little bit of background on what a plan development is. Um, it's both a development type and a legal process. So I pulled this from the development code. Um, there are a few principles of a plan development. Um, it includes a mixture of housing types at different kinds of densities. Um, there's flexibility in site planning and land use. Uh, it encourages environmental conservation. It promotes coordination of building form and it provides common recreation areas. Um, so there's kind of a trade-off with a plan development, uh, implementing what the code refers to as outstanding design elements 
um, may not be explicitly supported by the development code. So the applicant is allowed to modify quantitative code requirements. And so the job of planning commission and city council is to determine if there is a fair trade-off, that if the things that they're proposing warrant um, a change in some of the quantitative code requirements. So this is what the applicant is proposing. Um, on the right is the lower views. Um, this is oriented not exactly north-south, if you'll notice kind of over here on the left um, where this north arrow is pointing. So the lower views are south of the upper views. Um, so it's a total of 122 lots. It's 120 single family lots and two multifamily lots. So phase one is the lower views. Um, this is on the east side of Vista Loop Drive, southeast side of Vista Loop Drive. Um, this includes uh, 32 row houses, which are these narrow lots right here. Uh, one multifamily lot, which is uh, lot 72 over here, uh, which is proposed to contain about 24 multifamily units. And then um, 39 single family lots. Phase two is the upper views. They're proposing um, one multifamily lot, uh, which is that large one at the top, um, to also contain 24 units. And then this, uh, the upper views contains 49 single family units. Um, one thing that I just wanted to point out is that you'll notice quite a few green tracts. Um, those are open space and recreation tracts. Um, but one thing that uh, I just want to mention now that I'll get into a little bit more detail uh, in a bit is that all of the open space is being proposed to be maintained by a homeowners association as opposed to being um, dedicated to the city. So the applicant um, will be required to pay a fee in lieu of dedicating parkland to the city. So one of the things that they're requesting is a zone map amendment. Um, according to uh, section 1764, um, which is the plan development chapter in the development code, uh, when a plan development project has been approved, the official zoning map shall be amended by ordinance to denote the new PD plan, develop, plan development overlay designation. So the zoning map isn't necessarily changing the SFR to a higher density zoning designation. Um, it's just adding a PD overlay. So one of the um, big quantitative modifications to the development code that the applicant is asking for is a change in density. So under the current zoning designation SFR, um, according to the usable site area, uh, a minimum of 63 and a maximum of 159 single family homes are allowed. Um, the applicant is requesting a, a density bonus as part of the PD process. So according to the code, um, a PD is allowed up to 25% um, of a density increase um, upon a finding that the planned development is outstanding in planned land use and design and provides exceptional advantages in living conditions and amenities not found in similar developments constructed under regular zoning. So again, that's kind of the, the thing that's a little subjective about the planned development um, legal process is that um, planning commission needs to determine you know, if that trade-off is fair. So the applicant can request up to 25% uh, density increase, but they're re requesting a 6% density increase. So some of the outstanding design elements, and I put that word outstanding in quotes because that's what's used in the development code. Um, these are the ones that are pointed out by the applicant. Um, they argue that no lots are platted within the FSH. There's a mix of housing types and densities. Uh, there are private recreation tracks integrated into the development. Um, there's a proposed allay of trees along the majority of street frontages, so that goes beyond our regular planner strip and street tree requirements. Um, they're proposing a sound wall along Highway 26 that I'll go into a little bit more detail in a bit. Um, and the open space and active recreation areas total more than 
what would be required if they were dedicating it to the city. So um, some of the code deviation requests, in addition to um, that density increase include row houses and multifamily housing. So because the site is zoned as single family residential, uh, row houses and multifamily housing are not a permitted use, but they can be permitted under a plan development. Um, another one is smaller lot sizes. So SFR requires a minimum lot size of 7,500 square feet. Um, some of the lots go down to a, a little over 4,000 square feet. Um, another uh, request is smaller minimum average lot width, um, which kind of follows the smaller lot size. Right now the code requires an average lot width of 60 feet, um, but some of the lot sizes because of um, their footprints can't meet that lot width. Um, the applicant is requesting smaller interior side yard setbacks, smaller rear yard setbacks, and they are also requesting longer block lengths. So the code um, has a set uh, length that a block can be, and they're requesting to um, go beyond that. They're also requesting a couple of special variances. Um, staff determined that qualitative code deviations are not covered under the plan development process. Rather, they are subject to the special variance process. So one of, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about these. One of them is um, front doors on the southwest side of the upper views, um, according to the code, would need to be facing Highway 26 because that's a transit street, um, but they're proposing for them to face internal streets. And then the second special variance being requested is removing sidewalks from various street frontages. So that first one, um, the development code says that homes abutting a transit street must face the transit street. Um, lots 99 and 103 through 121 in the upper views do about Highway 26, but since the applicant is proposing a sound wall behind those homes, um, the applicant is requesting that these homes face the internal street. And then that second special variance, um, the code requires um, sidewalks and planter strips along all streets. Um, the applicant is requesting to have that requirement waived along the south side of the view drive, which is what connects Vista Loop to um, the lower views. Uh, and then they're also requesting to install a meandering walkway along Bonnie Street, the view drive, and Vista Loop in lieu of sidewalks. So this is that tree LA that they were um, requesting or that they were proposing as one of their outstanding design elements. So in this image, um, the red that you see are those meandering um, sidewalks. They are proposing phasing. So phase one would be the lower views and phase two would be the upper views. Um, that does create two um, things that needed to be determined. So paying the fee, fees in lieu for parks. Um, we recommend, um, if this does get approved, we recommend that those uh, fees in lieu are paid prior to each phase being recorded. So it would be two separate calculations. One would be for the lower views and one would be for the upper views. Um, it also affects the expiration dates. Um, we're recommending that each phase is allowed two years to complete platting requirements um, with the two-year clock starting for the second phase at the recording date of phase one. Um, the rest of this are just gonna kind of be little things that I wanna make sure um, Planning Commission is aware of that they can um, have all the information that they need. So one of the um, things that ODOT and the applicant um, had some discussion about was a right turn lane from Highway 26 onto Vista Loop Drive. So it's my understanding that this slip lane right here is not there anymore. Um, ODOT recommended that the applicant constructs um, a right turn lane from Highway 26 onto Vista Loop Drive. Um, 
the applicant's traffic engineer um, wrote a memo um, stating that because recent improvements have already been made um, on that street to support residential development, additional improvements are necessary. So improvements were made um, based on a previous uh, residential development that was going to go on the site, but um, did not. And so uh, the applicant argues that those um, improvements that were made uh, are sufficient for uh, future residential development. Um, another thing we wanted Planning Commission to look at was um, a future street layout. So in the upper views, um, this right over here is Knapp Street. Um, staff is recommending that there be a street stub or at least a pedestrian connection through lots 91 and 92 to make sure that there's connectivity for future development. Um, the applicant did come back and say that um, that probably would not be necessary. So that's up for planning commission to weigh. Um, I mentioned earlier a homeowners association. So the applicant uh, is requesting that an HOA be responsible for the uh, upkeep and maintenance of all of the open space and recreation tracks, as well as the meandering sidewalk. Um, the uh, staff did recommend that um, in the event that the homeowners association dissolves, um, responsibility for uh, the sidewalk and the open space will be transferred to adjacent property owners. And that would be included in as a restrictive covenant. Um, and then if maintenance of those areas isn't sufficiently performed, the city can maintain them and then charge the appropriate party. Uh, I also wanted to just talk briefly about the sound wall. So it's uh, again along the upper views behind the homes that abut Highway 26. Uh, six feet tall, made from a material called verticrete. Um, one of the recommendations that we've made is that uh, if this is approved, the applicant would need to plant additional vegetation between the sound wall and the sidewalk along Highway 26 um, to make it a little more pedestrian scaled. A couple of documents that we received between the time that we submitted the staff report a week ago and tonight's meeting, uh, one of which is the uh, recommendations from the Parks and Trails Advisory Board. Um, one of the things that they recommended is a trail easement to accommodate uh, some plans in the 2021 Parks Master Plan as a condition for approval. Um, they also wanted to make sure that we accept park the fees in lieu for parks based on the actual density and not the zone density, which uh, that's a, that is what we've calculated is based on the actual proposed density. Um, and then they also just expressed a concern about the HOA eventually dissolving and um, making sure that, you know, what, what would happen if that were the case. Um, just making sure that there's a plan in place for what would happen if that HOA dissolves. Uh, we also received a letter from the Fair Housing Council of Oregon, and they recommended um, additional Goal 10 analysis. Goal 10 relates to um, housing availability. So that's something we'd be able to put in for the City Council meeting. Um, I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about the public comments we've received. As of today, we've received um, 15 public comments. Um, some of the common concerns are uh, potential encroaching development in the FSH, um, capacity of fire, police, and public utilities to adequately serve the development, uh, increased traffic on already busy streets, um, removal of wild animal habitat, significant increase in housing density, which would change the character of the area. Um, there are concerns about lowering value of the land, um, a lack of amenities for future residents, since it is um, kind of uh, removed from the rest of the city, um, and then also safety walking along those streets. So in the staff report, starting on page 34, um, instead of a list of conditions, um, Kelly and I decided that it would be 
better to um, come up with kind of a list of guiding questions for plan for planning commission to consider. So the big one is, you know, is the proposed plan development outstanding in planned land use and design? And does it provide exceptional advantages in living conditions and amenities not found in similar developments constructed under regular zoning? And just to review those quantitative things that they're requesting are the density bonus, permitting row housing and multifamily housing, allowing for smaller lot sizes, um, and with that smaller average lot widths, and allowing for longer block lengths. Um, the second thing is um, does Planning Commission recommend approval for the special variance requests? One of those was the sidewalk variance and then also permitting the homes to face internal streets rather than um, Highway 26. Um, <clears throat> does Planning Commission remove, uh, recommend approval of phasing? Um, and just a reminder that affects both the parks, the fees and loo, as well as the expiration dates. Um, we're interested in Planning Commission's recommendations for a right turn lane from Highway 26 onto Vista Loop Drive, uh, recommendation for extending Knapp Street as a future um, potential street connection. Um, if Planning Commission is on board with the recommendation for additional planting requirements along the sound wall, um, and then some open ended questions. If Planning Commission has any additional recommendations related to the maintenance of open space and the sidewalk owned by a proposed HOA? And does the Planning Commission have any other recommendations related to modifying other findings or conditions? I tried to make that as brief as possible. I don't know if I was successful, but. Thank you, Shelley. I have a few other things to add on to that. Um, So if you look in the packet that's before you tonight on the website, you'll see that there's the, the first link is 2000-028, the views PD, PDF. That basically is the staff report that Shelly just went over um, and consolidated it down the best we could. It's, you know, 30 some pages long. So that contains all the findings and conditions um, as written by staff. And then in that document is also is a slew of exhibits, including exhibits from the applicant, from agencies, um, like at the public works director, transit director, and so on. And then there's also, I believe, 10 public comments in there. If you go to the next one, which is called the views PD additional exhibits from the public, that's five additional public comments that we received since this went to publication on our website um, last Monday on November 16th. The next document is the views PD additional exhibits from the applicant. Those are a few exhibits that we missed um, when we uploaded it on the 16th. So those should have been included in the first attachment, um, but they were just missed. So we wanted to include those on the website. The next one, the views PD requested modifications from applicant. This is something we've been talking to the applicant about last week. It's from Tracy Brown Planning Consultants LLC. We received it yesterday on Sunday, so we didn't really get a chance to look at it much until today. Um, however, we're fine with most, if not all, of the recommendations um that he that mr brown makes in this memo that we received yesterday um, a lot of them are pretty small changes but they do kind of um, for example one of them kind of just gives more flexibility for the public works department and the applicants engineer to work on lighting details um, another one as you'll see i'm just giving a couple examples here another one you'll see it talks about cul-de-sacs and how much driveway approach areas within the cul-de-sac and they actually prove through the burden of proof that they attach in here with some documents that they're meeting the code so they feel like there shouldn't be any shared driveways within the cul-de-sacs uh, staff tends to agree with that because as they prove in this attachment they are meeting the code standard of no greater than 50 percent of driveway cuts so i just wanted to point out that this document uh, mr brown did a really good job of summarizing some of the uh, applicants concerns from the staff report that we published on the 16th um, and after talking to the applicant last week and looking at their memo further yesterday and mainly today 
you know, as the director, I don't have any issue with any of these recommendations in that memo. The last one is, hold on one second, the Views PD Fair Housing Council of Oregon. We received that today. And as Shelly already pointed out, that's, um, it's kind of a boilerplate memo that we typically get from them. And then they change a couple sentences um, to reflect the proposal before you. But as you, most of you remember, we've received almost this exact same memo now five or six times. The Fair Housing Council of Oregon is basically looking out for goal 10 housing. And so we'll, you know, we would make some additional findings as we have with the other applications and coordinate with the Fair Housing Council of Oregon to make sure they're satisfied with the modifications we've made to the findings. So we, we've done that on at least four to five different applications. So that's nothing really new. Uh, other than that, I didn't have anything else, but I just wanted to kind of go through everything on the website for the benefit of both the commission, the applicant, and for the people in attendance tonight, um, since we have 13 other attendees as well. Um, and with that, I think that's all staff has at the time. Okay, thank you, both of you. We're going to move right into the applicant's presentation for your 15 minutes of fame. Who do we have? You have uh, Tracy Brown. Oh, hi, Chase. Good evening. Uh, I live at 17075 Fur Drive in Sandy. And we also have tonight uh, Mac Even, the uh, developer and applicant, and I'll ask him to, he wants to say a few words in a second. And we have Ray Moore of Alcani Surveyors and Planners, Mike Robinson, attorney. And then on the phone, we have Mike Ard, the traffic consultant, as well as Todd Prager, the arborist for the project. Uh, so with that, yeah, I'd like, at this time, I'd just like to introduce Mac Even of Even Better Homes, who's the developer um, and he wanted to say a few words. Go ahead, Mac. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, apologize. I'm, I'm uh, doing this from my bed because I broke my foot over the weekend. So I'm not sitting in my office. I've got my foot elevated right now. But uh, I just want to introduce myself. Um, I'm a builder and a developer in the community. And I have been in this community my entire life. I've been developing properties and building homes here. I grew up in Damascus, went to Barlow High School. I still live in the area and um, I've worked with several of the municipalities in the area and uh, I find Sandy to be a great place to work and I'm, I'm very excited about this project. Um, we're asking for a PD because the property has a considerable amount of FSH overlay and we thought it would be important to protect, you know, this, uh, these resources and through a PD, it gives us some flexibility in terms of how we protect the, uh, the FSH overlays and also give us a very good mix of state of, uh, housing types. Um, you know, SFR allows us to do 7,500 foot lots, 60 foot minimum widths, things of that nature, which is a, f a fairly typical development in the city of Sandy. With this project, it's giving us the ability to um, create housing types, everything from apartments to townhouses to some smaller lots, from larger lots, the back to green space, while preserving the views and the natural environment and scenery that exists on the site, and also some higher end homes so it's, it really becomes a site where a family or, you know, a, people in the community of Sandy can literally go from shortly out of high school, getting their first apartment to moving into a row house, to a smaller home, to a larger lot, larger home, and essentially age in this community. It also has a lot of amenities for all ages, all income brackets, things like that in terms of our parks, our recreational um, activities for kids and the community. One thing we thought was important was to make sure that these amenities are open to everybody in the community, not just the members of this homeowners association. So we intend to 
record and access easement for the general public so they too can use the parks and the amenities that are created in this development. Um, it's not, we're not looking at it as, as it, looking at it as an exclusive um, community and neighborhood. We want it to be inclusive to as many people in the Sandy community as possible. And good Lord, you look at that view and everybody needs to be able to appreciate that. Um, one of the things that I know is a concern is the fact that this will be governed by an, a homeowners association in terms of maintaining these amenities and taking care of the parks and things of that nature. Um, and I know homeowners associations have a way of dissolving and disappearing over the years. This homeowners association is going to be managed by a management company. It's not just going to be left up to the people living in this community. Um, and the best example I have of that is my mother lives in a uh, condominium development for 55 and older people in Gresham called Eagle Estates East. And it's interesting going back, that community has been there for over 50 years with an active HOA that maintains all of their open spaces and everything to do with the community. <clears throat> my grandmother was part of that about 40 years ago. She's now 102 years old and the HOA still exists and my mother is now a part of that same homeowners association. So it can be done and that is the intent of this homeowners association. And I have a vested interest in, in it staying for a longer period of time indefinitely because I intend to keep and, uh, and own the apartments that are being built on this site. And so I have a vested interest in making sure things are, the amenities are kept up to shape and, and things are done the way that they should under an HOA and uh, has a chance to go on in perpetuity. Um, another thing about these parks that, should, that I wanna make sure people understand is the parks will be owned by the Homeowners Association and maintained by the Homeowners Association open to the public, but also we will be additionally paying into the parks fee in lieu. So we will paying the, be paying the system development charges for the parks for the entire community of the city of Sandy, not just this subdivision. And, um, but these will be additional parks on top of that. And the development will also be able to create a considerable amount of additional amenities throughout the city of Sandy. Um, and I'm very excited about this project. It's, it's allowed us to have some creativity that we otherwise, you know, uh, lack with just a general overall code, building codes in the single family residential. Um, and I think it's gonna be a wonderful, wonderful place for people to live and raise their families and spend their days. So with that. All thank right, yeah, thanks. Oh, go ahead, sorry. No, yeah, I just, thank you, Mac, appreciate that. So yeah, Mac will be available to also answer any questions you may have. So I wanted to share my screen and I have a little uh, presentation I'd like to go through and some of which is very similar to what um, Shelley went through, but I just wanted to kind of reemphasize some of the points here. Let's see here. Let's see. There we go. So I'm calling it the views plan development, a unique living experience in Sandy, Oregon. And the reason I think it is unique is, you know, there is a variety of housing types, as was mentioned, um, both larger lots, smaller lots, single family detached, as well as attached townhomes and two lots that will contain multifamily. And I'll, I'll talk about a little more detail in a minute, but all of the structures, we submitted uh, kind of sketches and concepts for the structures, both the single family detached as well as the townhomes. And all of them meet or exceed the Sandy style design standards. And the, I'll show you some pictures of what the townhome concept is. And they, I think it's a very unique concept. I know there's not any other like it in Sandy at least. So this, the development has quite a bit of enhanced amenities. 
you know, a variety of uh, active and passive recreational amenities. There's trail system, a Mount Hood viewing plaza. There's two half court basketball courts, uh, multiple play structures, and there's also a proposed dog park. And so the amount of parkland that's proposed is quite a bit more than what would otherwise be required if it were just a subdivision, as well as the area of open space is greater than protected or than required. You know, Shelley mentioned there's a decorative wall and the meandering sidewalk. So I think these are kind of also enhanced amenities for the development. So if you look at, she went through the intent section and it's, you know, we believe that the proposal furthers these intent statements contained in the plan development code by providing you know, usable, suitable recreation area, a variety of architectural styles, and, and you know, really enhances and takes into consideration the site in which uh, the development is being proposed. There's, so there's two parts to the plan development process. Um, I don't think Shelley mentioned that, but there's the conceptual development plan and the detailed plan. And the code allows these both to be combined into one process. And that's what we're doing tonight. We could have done just have them separately, but we prefer to do it as a combined review. I would mention that there's at least three other planned developments in Sandy. There's Salmon Creek Estates, and I worked on all of these as the planning director, Barlow Ridge and Hamilton Ridge, and all those were planned developments in Sandy. So as was mentioned, the PD process does allow modifications to the dimensional and quantitative standards. And we have requested some of these to setbacks, lot width, lot size, and block length standards. The PD also allows a density increase, as was mentioned. And so the code allows up to 25% if the development is outstanding and has exceptional advantages in living conditions and amenities not found in other developments. So with that, the minimum or the maximum density would have been 159 without this additional request. And so we're requesting nine additional units with the plan development process. We feel that with the amount of parkland, the protected open space, and all the other amenities, um, I think it, we feel it can be considered outstanding. And it does provide amenities and living conditions that are not found in any other development that I know of in Sandy, actually. So a little bit more detail, the PD section does require as a planned development, a minimum of 25% of the site be provided in open space. And we're proposing with this development 36%. So a little bit more you know, than what be required as the minimum. In addition, the plan, plan development, just through the code, does allow a variety of housing types and that lists those various housing types in that section. And so, as was mentioned, we're proposing some single family dwellings, some row homes or townhomes and uh, multifamily. And this would be the parkland dedication requirement or the calculation. So based on the number of units of 168 units, there would be a requirement to dedicate or provide 1.96 acres. And we're almost providing that all in the lower views where we have 1.86, and then we have an additional area in, in the upper views. So this is providing about three and a half acres of parkland, um, so well above what would be the minimum required. And as, as uh, Mac mentioned, you know, these privately owned and maintained spaces will be available for the public uh, to use. So I did wanted to quickly go through just a couple more details of the plan. Let's see here. 
and figure out where all this stuff is. There we go. So again, you're aware there's the lower views and this is the, the large open space area that we're proposing and then the upper views and there's highway 26 and just the loop. Again, kind of a more of a detailed into that. The fish overlay, the flood slope hazard overlay is this dashed line. So as you can see, none of the lots. Go ahead. Look like your, your screen's uh, not showing any maps. Oh, it's not? Okay. No, it went south on you. Yeah. It's, just, it's kind of weird. All right. I mean, sorry about that. You might restart it or something like that. Is it working now? Yeah. Are the you trans that transition yes. just didn't work for you. <laughs> okay. So you can you can see the screen now. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I don't. I don't. Hopefully, I'm not talking too quickly. But this is the fish overlay, this dash line, and so you can see none of the lots are proposed to be platted into that area. And the upper views. Um, here's Highway 26. You know, here's some open space that's proposed. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit more detail about that open space. You know, going down into the lower views. Let's see, I think I'll go to this, this map here. So go down into the lower views will be a meandering sidewalk connecting it to the upper views. And that sidewalk will continue along Bonnie Street. And then there'll be a kind of a Mount Hood viewing plaza here with a small play structure. And that'll be connected to a couple of trails that will go off in either direction. There's an additional trail system that goes off this way and a half court basketball over here. You know, so all this, all these amenities will be available to the residents as well as the community in general. In the upper views, there's a kind of a large grassy area with a half court basketball, a play structure, a little dog park over here. And this, you know, we kind of wanted to do something a little bit different with the sidewalks. So this is the sidewalk that we're requesting to not put in because we feel the primary you know, travel would be back and forth between here and really to, to accommodate that and have a little bit wider area with some landscaping. We're kind of pushing the roadway to the south in order to create this kind of landscaped, um, you know, avenue, we'll say, as you can go into the property on the sidewalk. So there's just Tracy, there's no dog park in the uh, lower views. No, there, yeah, there's not a dog park in the lower views. So now I'm going to real quickly, if I can go again to my screen over here, try to show you the um, couple of the architectural um, designs. Let's see, where is all this? Stuff? I don't know, maybe I'm getting, uh, I don't know what happened to my other, there it is. So this, these are some of the architectural plans that were submitted. And I'll just kind of quickly go through these to give you a flavor of the design. You know, it's kind of your classic Sandy style. So some of the larger lots. We're not, we're not, seeing, have, we're not seeing anything, oh, not Tracy. Seeing, well, okay, just sorry, thank you, water, appreciate Tracy. that. You're not sharing your screen. Uh, there we go. I'm doing it now, hopefully. Is okay. That working? That's good. All right. Thank you. Sorry about that. So I wanted to just show, you know, some of the uh, design of the larger lot homes. You know, pretty sandy style features. But I really like to want to show you these uh, town homes as we get a little further down. So the town homes are unique in the sense so they'll be facing Bonnie Street with a meandering sidewalk in front of them. 
and this is the front door over here. And then the back, there will be they'll be loaded by the alley, and between the alley and the garage, there'll be a little courtyard. So this is kind of looking at the front, the side, and here is the rear. And so it's kind of unique of with townhomes to have some sort of a outdoor space that you can have the barbecue or you know garden or whatever you know being small but still it's something um and that i don't i don't know if there's any other project like that in sandy i think these will be very uh this is looking at it from the garage so you'll go into the garage there'll be a door going through your, the walkway and then into the back door or there'll be a door on the front of the house. So that kind of shows it in a perspective view. So I guess with that, um, you know, we feel that the proposal ha is uh, designed, you know, with the site in mind. Um, it's, it is providing amenities, you know, exceeding um, the standards for open space and parkland dedication and we feel it can be very well approved um, if you so find that it uh, meets you know all of your concerns. Um, we do have Ray Moore here to answer any questions you might have um, as for the future street plan that was noted as well as Mike Ard who can answer any questions you might have about ODOT's uh, request for a right turn lane. I guess with that, I'll kind of end my presentation with uh, you know, thanking you for your time and hopefully you can uh, find um, ability to approve the application. Thanks, Tracy. For the record, Ray Moore, PO Box 955, Sandy, Oregon. Uh, I, I'll be real quick. I just want to point out a couple of things if I could. Um, I'd like to share my screen. So <clears throat> one thing that I just want to point out, you know, everybody's always concerned about on-street parking. And what we did is we took um, a, a lot of time and worked out, you know, where, where and how can we do parking. One of the big things that we really, um, what we did back here, uh, you can see my cursor behind the, the row of houses that Tracy was showing you the architecture on. We, we widened up the public alley and we provided parking along the entire public alley. The curb to curb width of this alley is the same as a local street, it's 28 feet curb to curb. We're not proposing any parking on the north side because it's primarily driveway drops. Um, with the, you know, with the row houses, we are proposing two car garages uh, and also two cars in each individual driveway. So in addition, like I was saying, the on-street parking requirement, the total requirement for the entire project is um, 120 on-street parking spaces. We're proposing 187. So 67 parkings, on-street parking spaces above and beyond what the code requires. Um, so, you know, we wanted to make sure there's going to be adequate parking. One of the other things that uh, when we laid this out, this, this pedestrian connection that we've, we spoke to several times leads to the viewpoint. This was probably the best lot in the development. And I pointed that out to Matt. And my, Matt said, no, let's, let's open it up. And so everybody can enjoy this, this view. So a lot of thought went into this sidewalk. And we wanted a, a more of a pedestrian experience. And if you, if you notice, uh, the red sidewalk that meanders to the viewpoint, there's not one single family residential driveway that backs out over the sidewalk. So it, it's more of a, you know, a, a, a nice stroll up to the viewpoint. You're not worrying about cars backing out and whatnot. So we're, we're trying to really make that something special. <clears throat> And just real quick, there was a comment about the turn lane. Um, Mike Ard's here in my office and he can speak to it in more detail, but in his report, he analyzed the uh, right turn lane requirement that, that came from ODOT. There was some discussion. In Mike's report, he, he goes through ODOT's requirements. You know, they, they have standards that trigger right turn lanes. This does not trigger it. Uh, in fact, when we, when we did the partition before for the uh, for the, R, or for the uh, RV dealership, we were required by ODOT to remove the slip lane. 
and we made we widened the highway here and made some improvements to the edge of the highway to satisfy ODOT, which currently satisfies the the existing development. And, and Mike could go into detail with that uh, if you have any questions. Um, with that said, you know the typical we, we can get all the utilities there, um, sanitary sewer. We have to extend it off site. We have stormwater. You know we've done preliminary reports and everything on that end. So if you have any questions to that, I can I can answer those as well. So with that said, that, that's kind of all I have, unless you guys have some questions for me. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. So yeah, that uh, concludes our presentation. Ray, do you want to stop sharing your screen? Oh, uh, just a quick question. Another um, question so that. are you saying that, um, that with your improvements already you've made, you feel a car that's going to the west can get off to the side and turn um, without any additional uh, right turn lane being built? Correct. When we when we close the slip lane, we actually widen the pavement um, to accommodate that movement. So those improvements were already done in accordance with the code, in accordance with ODOT. So. Thank you. Any other questions you might have for us at this time? Hey, thank you. Is it, Jerry, Jerry, just before you go into the public comment portion, um, this mm -hmm. is Kelly speaking. So th this is one of the rare circumstances where ODOT's made a recommendation and staff feels and our traffic consultant feels that the applicant already made the correct and necessary modifications with the previous land use application as Ray pointed out. And we feel that the additional modifications that ODOT is requesting with a turn lane at this point is an overreach. And so if you look in the staff report, staff is not recommending to go along with the ODOT requirement. And that's why this is kind of a central point. Um, it is not typical that staff does not agree with ODOT and just does not recommend one of their recommendations or one of their requirements, but um, we're in agreement with the applicant that this right turn lane, if it was or should have been required, it should have been required in 2018 when they made the improvements for Johnson RV and um, Peach Orchard or Timberline Estates, which was formally analyzed on this site. So I just wanna point that out. That's kind of what we're looking at there. So Tracy, what's the legal part of that? I mean, if just ODOT owns the highway, if they say, Tracy, I mean, Tracy can they put Kelly? it in? Who was that question directed to? <laughs> you, well, it's directed to you. I mean, if, uh, I mean, ODOT's recommending it's their highway and I know you, you have a logical disagreement, but if they say, I mean, put it in, do they have the authority of to force that to be done? Nope, the only authority they have is to appeal the land use decision. So if ultimately the planning commission does not recommend the right turn lane as recommended by ODOT and they, the planning commission goes with staff and the applicant and then city council say they were to approve this and they also do not recommend the right turn lane, the only recourse ODOT has at that time is to appeal the land use decision to the land use board of appeals. They do not have any other statutory ability to make the applicant put in that right turn lane. Chris, I don't know if you want to add anything onto that. That's correct. Um, conversely, I would say sometimes it, it is the case where you impose a condition requested by ODOT and in those circumstances, I would appreciate it if ODOT would defend that condition and they don't. Um, <laughs> but when they, 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 do, they don't, there's no jurisdiction here for them to require uh, any particular condition. They're in the same position as any other adjacent property owner by way of analogy. Then just uh, to kind of it's one topic. I know Jerry like to kind of keep things um, kind of towards the end, but um, based on the way it currently looks, if ODOT was to bow their back, if, if does it really mean all you have to do is just go in and stripe it as opposed to build something? No, I don't believe that's the case. I believe they would have to move. Um, no, I, I think it would be much more than striping because they would want a taper length 
going back a certain distance. That's more of an engineering question, but no, it, yeah. I believe it would be a much bigger deal than just restriping. Right. Okay. I think it would be modifying asphalt um, and potentially also that intersection and then also um, potentially moving storm drainage areas and the whatnot. Um, I think, I think the biggest, the bigger issue is that this intersection was all looked at in 2018 and Mr. Picking, who's the current property owner of the lower views, already paid money to improve this intersection to ODOT specifications just two years ago. And now they're basically, in my opinion, ODOT's coming back to the table and saying, well, maybe the intersection improvements weren't exactly what we wanted, and now we want additional intersection improvements. I, th I think the time was two years ago, and I think if ODOT does believe it's a safety issue, they can um, pay for the intersection improvements at this time. Okay. Well, as long as as long as we're on it, I gotta throw in mind because I live east of the intersection and go by it a couple times a day, and have uh, a person that I help with on, over on RT Street. Anyway, with the improvements that have been made, the slip lane that used to be referred to as the slip lane that was there before allowed you to come off the highway at a high rate of speed, and the and it was 2018 when they changed it. And now I went, I'm not gonna say it's a problem, but to safely navigate and make a right-hand turn heading westbound on 26 onto Vista, you have to drop your speed significantly. And so that's the, my thing is just the practicality is you're looking behind you. If you wanna make that right-hand turn, you're looking in your rear view mirror and making sure the traffic is coming up over the top of you. How to solve that, I don't know, but there, there is some, there is some, something with that intersection that needs to be looked at. Again, I referred to Mr. Mobley as traffic engineer. He can, he can figure it out. <laughs> yeah, I'll weigh in real quick. I, I reviewed all that information. I thought it was kind of a curious circumstance. Um, I agree with you, Ron. Speeds are high there. Um, I think they're too high, but that's sort of a neither here nor there. Um, but we, when they took that slip lane out, they took that out for a safety improvement just because getting off the highway real fast creates a safety problem on Vista Loop. Um, but that is the configuration that ODOT specified for that revised intersection layout. And, uh, and they do have um, objective standards about when a right turn lane is needed. And based on the applicant's traffic study, it shows that it's not needed. So. I thought their their comment letter requesting a right turn lane was sort of odd, and also their silence in responding to the applicant's assertion that it's not needed. So it is an odd circumstance. I sort of I reviewed that analysis. It looks like it's not warranted per ODOT standards, but it is not going to be the right turn to make when traffic's coming up on you for sure. Yeah, I just say that even if nothing more is built there. If you're if you're heading westbound and you make a right hand turn on, you have to really drop your speed. And it's so what Todd said the traffic is the uh, speed is too high to make a that hard of a right hand turn without slowing down significantly. Okay, let's. Uh, how soon let's after on. that does it go, does the speed go down? Isn't it doesn't it go down to forty not too long after that? It's a good um, half a mile, probably closer to a mile down. Oh, okay. Okay. It's after you go past the other end of Vista Loop. Save your save your thoughts, park your thoughts, and uh, we'll bring bring them back. We want to give the public opportunity, and we will move to public testimony now. And um, if you're listening, just so you know how we would do this. Um, We'll call for public testimony in three sections. Uh, first of all, I'll be calling for any uh, public testimony who are in favor of the proposal. Following that, we will give opportunity for anybody to speak who is not in favor of the proposal. And then finally, we have kind of a neutral category. If you find yourself neither uh, for it or against it, but have a, a comment or an observation that you want to make, 
um, that would be your opportunity. And because I have a feeling, I can't see how many people are on, but I have a feeling we've got quite a few based on something that uh, Kelly said earlier. Uh, just some guidelines as you speak to us tonight. Um, please try to avoid repetition. If someone has already expressed the same thoughts that you have, um, it's sufficient to say that you agree with them. And um, even, if, even if that's all you say for your testimony is that I agree with the previous person, that is, that is fine and that is welcome. If you have any documents, maps, letters of such that you wish to have considered by the Planning Commission, uh, they must formally be placed into the record of this proceeding. And to do that, either before or after you speak, uh, email your materials to planning at ci, the first two letters of city, dot sandy dot or dot us. Again, that's planning at ci dot sandy dot or dot us and staff will make sure that your um, materials are properly recorded and processed. And um, <clears throat> we do wanna try and restrict your testimony tonight to at no more than three minutes. It sounds short, but a lot can be said in three minutes. Um, again, if you are, are on the Zoom call and you wish to testify when we call, uh, click the raise hand button and wait to be recognized. If you're on the telephone, you dial star nine to raise your hand and uh, wait to be recognized. And finally, when you do uh, begin your testimony, please give us your name and your street address for the record. Those are required. So with that, we will call for testimony of those who are in favor of the proposal. Raise your hand. Okay, Chairman Crosby, I don't see any hands raised. Okay, then we will move to uh, proponent testimony. If you are not in favor of the proposal, uh, raise your hand on the button or star nine on your phone. Okay, I have a few hands raised so far. So uh, Mary D was the first person to raise their hand. So I will allow Mary D to speak first. Uh, once I allow you to speak, uh, you might have to unmute yourself and please say your name and address for the record. Okay, just wanna make sure that you guys can hear me before I start. Yes. 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 Okay, my name is uh, Mary Diami, and uh, we live at 416. Can you spell your last name, please? D-Y-A-M-I. And we're at 41625 Southeast Vista Loop Drive. We are the first house on the right, meaning we would share two property lines with the lower views. Um, I have several things that I'd like to bring up, but I know I have to keep it short. So my first one is, in all of the discussion of the things that are going to be built there, we've seen the row houses, we've seen the um, single family homes, we've not seen anything about the apartments. My biggest issue is the apartments, considering one of them uh, is set to be built right at our rear property line. It, from what I see on the plans, our back property line would butt right up against a parking lot. A um, couple things will happen with that. The uh, view that everyone's talking about, all of these new residents enjoying, that's so beautiful and everyone. That everyone should have access to. We just moved here in September. We just bought this home. We wake up every morning and we look at that view off of our back deck. And so, you know, we're, the gentleman who's proposing this um, development 
you know, he's talking about this view that everyone loves and that, you know, you can get your first apartment and then go to your first row house and then buy a home, which is essentially the American dream. But our American dream is in jeopardy due to this. I understand we can't, we can't prevent growth, but there has to be something that can be done because there are three houses in a row right here. We're all grandfathered into, um, we're not in the city limits. We're outside the city limits, but we're gonna lose everything that we have all moved here for if, if this goes through the way it's planned. Um, lastly, in regards to the traffic situation, the gentleman that mentioned that you have to go almost to a complete crawl in order to make the turn, uh, he's correct. I worked at Johnson RV for three years. Uh, I make that turn two to four times per day, depending. And you literally have to come almost to a complete stop, especially if traffic is coming off of Vista Loop onto 26. So I don't know how anyone could safely make that turn if they didn't come to almost a complete stop and then make the very next turn into what would be the entrance into the lower views. So my, my request is that you would really consider um, not approving this for multifamily. I'm not going to sit here and beg for you to not approve it at all because I understand growth happens, but there has to be a, a happy medium. Um, I'd also request a continuance on this so that we could um, talk with our neighbors more about the situation and what is at stake with the fires and COVID and the election. It's been really hard to get with any of our neighbors to discuss any of this. So we would also ask for a continuance on this. Thank you. Hold on one second here. My computer is not letting me. Hold on one second. Okay. Um, the next person up, let me lower hands here. The next person up is Karma39. Kind of a ominous one, I guess. <laughs> Karma39. Okay, I'm going to promote this person to speaking. And again, please uh, state your name and address for the record. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, okay. My name's John Barmettler. I live at 41613 Southeast Vista Loop. I'm right next door to Mary. I share the same concern with this uh, multifamily lot that you're putting, you know, adjacent to both of our properties. Uh, I'm still not clear. One of your presenters said something about 120 homes, single family and 48 multifamily. That adds up to 168. Some of your proposals are saying 120 houses, 122. I still don't fully understand how many multifamily homes you're in, you're proposing. Today you said something about six or two, I'm not really sure. So I'm, I'm kind of confused about that issue. But the, the basic thing, I'm, I'm just gonna read something off that I put together today, but we moved to Sandy three years ago because it was a small town and a somewhat rural area. We really love the atmosphere here and the, the small town feel of it and the rural community that we share just outside of the city. And in that time, I've seen a trend to build as many houses as possible in whatever space they'll fit in in Sandy. And it, it, it almost seems contrary to the, the Sandy style look in which the city takes its pride. The proposed housing pro, you know, project off of Vista Loop Drive seem to fit the trend, you know, just keep building. And, and the houses are getting so crowded, it's, it's ridiculous. Vista Loop Drive's a narrow road almost completely without a sidewalk. Walkers, joggers, cyclists use the street as well as daily dog walkers. The usage will, of course, you know, the, the home, the new home is going to increase, you know, that foot traffic and create problems with, you know, the small road width that we have out here. Backups occur daily going on and off of Highway 26. It's not just, if you're, if you're making a left turn onto 26 going to the east, you, you get stacked up there for a long time now. You put 120 plus cars in there. It's going to be a real mess. Um, the parking situation, I'm still not convinced that it's not going to back up onto the street. You know, they were promised, you know, adequate parking at the other end of the apartments put in there and they got 30 cars a night on the street, making a total mess. 
I don't know that the fire police, ambulance, and other emergency services would be impacted, but I, I hope they'd be looked into. And the utilities alone, I mean, are they uh, available to handle the excess load you're putting in? The utilities are going to be affected, water, gas, electricity, uh, waste manage, the sewage. I don't even know how they're going to run a sewer line, you know, out there. Uh, the suggested crowded community would largely become rental property, is my view, and completely destroy the nature and value of these existing homes here. It might be that building fewer but more upscale homes on larger lots would help to maintain the country feel of the street as well as keeping property values up. In general, I am completely not in favor of developing a land as, proposed, as the proposal suggests. There's just too many houses, they're too close together, there, there's just too much change to a street that wants to maintain its identity. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you. just takes me a minute to go through all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next person with their hand up is Todd Springer. I'm going to be allowing to talk. You'll have to unmute yourself and please repeat your name and address for the record. Hello, my name is Todd Springer. My address is 18519 Ortiz Street. So I would basically be kitty corner from the... Um, the, where the park would be on the uh, new development. Um, I, I agree with, with the prior um, residents. You know, I would just like to ask you all to please drive down Vista Loop and feel the lumps in the road from, from all of the heavy traffic that has gone down it in the past because there is a lot of lumps in that road. Um, and drive down it at night once. My concern is, is there is no lighting down that street. It's extremely dark. And, um, you know, just the other night when I left to go to Fred Myers, a couple of deer jumped out in front of me. And luckily, you know, I drive nice and slow down that road because I've lived there a long time and I know, but uh, I, have, I have safety concerns for uh, future residents there. We know it's gonna grow, but I think uh, single family residence is what it was designed for and, and that's what it should remain. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next person is under the name of KFRA 0 <laughs> So uh, I'm going to allow this person to talk now. Please state your name and address for the record. Uh, first, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Randy Olson, O-L-S-O-N. I reside at 18515 Ortiz Way. So I actually would be uh, Todd Springer's neighbor. So I would be the second house from this uh, intersection going into the upper lot. So I'd like to start with the fact that I understand why we're trying to build and trying to expand. And I moved here 10 years ago into my house here and um, I had a field next to me and the Springer's house came in next to us and it's a nice big lot and we have plenty of room to, you know, can't throw a football across his lot, so I'm okay. Um, so I understand that change is going to happen. That intersection on Ortiz Way and Vista Loop will absolutely be a nightmare and that's just the start of, of the issue with the multiple uh, residents going in across the street. Um, and not to reiterate what Todd said, and I know we're not supposed to repeat, but if you haven't driven down this road at 20, 20 miles an hour in the dark, you need to commit to doing that to me tonight because the road's undrivable almost. It, it's a terrible road, the traffic, and if it's at five o'clock in the afternoon when our neighbors on the west end of Vista Loop are doing their daily walks or their dog walks, it's an obstacle course getting up and down this road and adding in the additional houses is it's an it's going to be an absolute nightmare. And going to some of the other people's comments about this is kind of our dream. We have a nice view of the mountain and everybody keeps talking about how great this is going to be. These lots on both sides are going to be great for people to move into houses. The people that it's going to affect adversely is the ones who have been here for 10 years and who bought this to be our view and our forever home. 
So yeah, this is great for everybody except for us. And I don't know that our opinions count. I don't know that this isn't an already a, a done deal and at a certain point we're wasting our time. But when I bought this house 10 years ago to grow up and to retire in, I didn't expect to not be able to get out of my driveway because a hundred and some odd houses are gonna be uh, within the same street. And, and the conversations about turning on and off of the east end of Vista Loop, if ODOT says that that needs to be changed and somebody disagrees with that, go sit out there at five o'clock in the afternoon and try coming off the freeway and have there be no cars in front of you, it's doable. And Todd, I um, apologize, I'm gonna massacre his last name, but Lazowski um, mentioned that, that, is a, that that's a danger pulling off of Highway 26 if you're westbound. It is, you have to slow down. You got trucks doing 55, 65 behind you. It's dangerous. If there's two cars turning at the same time, you almost have to continue going. You can't turn if there's another car because there's not enough space and time without rear-ending the other car or getting rear-ended. You literally have to go to the west end of Vista Loop and turn in. That's now, as the houses exist, without additional houses on, on Vista Loop. So I completely, I don't know what the fix is. I agree with you that the other way, when you came off the freeway at 55, people came off, uh, the other way was dangerous because if you're walking, people are doing 60 miles an hour when they hit that exit. Extending what they already have, which is pretty good for one car, may be the answer. Because again, if two cars are turning in at the same time and there's a hundred houses, a uh, hundred more cars down there, we know that's gonna happen on a Saturday afternoon after everybody's been skiing. Two cars cannot get into that turn lane at the same time without getting rear-ended. Two cars. Now we're talking four or five or six cars could be coming down and turning in at the same time. So without ranting on that, that's extreme danger. And I have two teenage boys. I don't want them getting rear-ended because it's unsafe. Um, as far as the, the parks and everything that we're talking about being built, that's all great. Um, and that's gonna bring more people to an area that's already gonna be congested. So my front yard will no longer be a place I can walk my dog peacefully. Um, I can't sit out in my front driveway and have a conversation because we just won't be the nice calm neighborhood. It's gonna be a busy city and that's not what this area was meant for. So the fix to this is not gonna be not to do it because I know that there's, there's not any of us on Vista Loop or anywhere on Ortiz Way that are gonna stop you guys from doing what you wanna do. The question would be is, can we make this a little bit more livable and have houses like ours and the, and the Springers next to me and the Androids on the other side of me, can we make it a little bit less um, congested and make larger houses? There isn't anything get built over there that's not gonna get sold, whether it's a large lot or small lot, Everybody wants to live out here. Let's make it livable for us who have already been here and don't ruin our property values because everybody else wants this beautiful scenery and to live the dream. You're killing our dreams by doing it. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your time and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. You might wanna ask if anybody else wants to comment uh, against it. I don't see any other hands raised. Oh, okay. That'd be the final call then. If you are not in favor of the proposal for your opportunity for public testimony. And keep in mind, as I said before, this will eventually make its way to city council and there would be a, uh, a similar opportunity for public comment at that meeting. Oh, I do see one more hand raised. It's phone number 1-503-516-7629. I'm gonna allow them to speak. Please state your name and address for the record. How does he unmute? There we go. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, this is John Andrade. Sorry about earlier. I don't know what was wrong with my microphone. Um, I live at 18509 Ortiz Street. My wife and I reside here for the last 15 years. We built this house 16 years ago. My concern is when we built this home and everyone around us, we met every one of the city's requirements of rezoning, covenants and restrictions, and we're not able to make any modifications. 
The Clean Water Act had been indicted, enacted by the city and we had to meet all those requirements. We, on the other hand, are not a developer and do not have the financial backing to be able to manipulate and ask for our concessions with zoning. A couple of things I'd like to say is that I do not approve and I'm not in favor of this zoning change. It'll have way more impact on the city than you are thinking about. Picture when you drive into, into Gresham and you realize you're in Gresham, it's boom, welcome to Gresham. Picture that when you come around Shorty's Corner, boom, welcome to Gresham. Is that the intent of our city is to turn this into Gresham? Because that's what it will look like the minute you drive off the mountain into our beautiful little city. It's a little aggravating because I think Mac Even and Tracy Brown, who I know, are romanticizing living here like it's everybody's dream. While I saved like my neighbors to build this home and this on this property. So why are you gonna change the zoning, the teeny little lots, which you and I both know will be a dissolved HOA over years, turn into rental properties, be a burden on the city and a burden on the taxpayers. Now look at the street map for the lower and upper views. The streets are loaded and littered with parking on the streets. Is the fire department okay with this? We're talking hundreds and hundreds of cars, hundreds of people, and less than an eighth of a mile area. I asked Mr. Picking. I know John Knapp. I asked him and I asked you, if you had single family residents zoned at the top of your street and this was happening to you, what would your response be? I also feel like even better homes is using a fair housing to try to push this through. When maybe Sandy could find another location that doesn't degrade the current area and the tax base that resides here. So I'm asking you to really seriously reconsider because I've seen what the staff's writings are and findings are. But this area has already been zoned. So the only way, and I ask you this with most kindness in my heart, is the only way to get things done in the city is to be a large developer and need to offset my infrastructure costs by putting in small teeny houses and putting an impact on the current residents. Thank you. Thank you. Now will be the final, final call for opponent <laughs> testimony. We still have neutral coming up, by the yeah. way. Uh, I don't see other, any other hands raised. Okay, so we will move to neutral testimony. Uh, just general comments. You're neither uh, for the proposal or against it, but have a comment for us. Again, raise your hand to be recognized, and uh, Kelly will do so. I do not see any hands raised, Chairman. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for your testimony. And um, we'll move right along to staff recap. Shelly, do you want to start this off? And then I have a few things I'll say after you go. Yeah, sure. So I just wanted to respond to a couple of things um, that were brought up in the public comments. Um, one was a question about what the apartments are going to look like. Um, that is something that would have to be determined in a future design review. So that would be a separate application that would go through, um, you know, the whole public notice process, go through um, a planning commission um, to determine exactly what those apartments are going to look like. Um, as far as granting a continuance, that's up to the discretion of planning commission, if that's something that they want to do. Um, the question about um, some perceived discrepancies about just how many homes and lots there are. So there are 122 lots. Um, 120 of those lots are going to have, are proposed to have um, 
one single family home each. So that's 120 single family homes. Two of the lots are proposed to have um, apartment complexes. And each one of those apartment complexes are gonna have 24 units. So that's 120 plus 24 plus 24 is 168 units. So that's 122 lots, 168 units. Um, as far as utilities and fire and making sure that, um, you know, uh, any kind of proposed development would be um, served adequately by uh, public services, um, you know, we do work with those other agencies to make sure that, um, you know, if a development does go through that um, everything is able to be served sufficiently by those public services. Um, and then finally, you know, I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, the job of planning commission and city council is to, you know, weigh what's in the best interests of the city with, you know, the rights of property owners to develop their property. And sometimes that is kind of a sticky situation to be in. And um, I don't envy being in that position. Um, so that is just kind of something that I, I, I wanted to say that, you know, when we talk about um, pr property rights, we also talk about, you know, the, the right for, you know, somebody who owns a piece of property to use it for economic benefit. Um, but, you know, needing to weigh that against what's in the best interest of the city. Um, so that's, I think that's all that I wanted to respond to with the public comments. So Kelly can go and take over. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Shelly. Um, since this is the first evidentiary hearing, um, we have to grant a continuance if it's requested. Um, if once the planning commission decides which date they'll continue it to, if somebody at that next hearing wants to request a continuance, then it's at the discretion of the planning commission whether they wanna grant an additional continuance. Um, typically we wouldn't just because at some point you need to come with a decision or a recommendation in this case. But um, since somebody did request the continuance this evening, we will have to grant that. Um, I'm sure we'll be talking about that more in a little bit. So I, I did wanna talk about a few things here. Um, so it is a recommend recommendation of approval from staff. So something that I would like the public, and I believe most of the planning commissioners are aware of this as well, is when we start working with an applicant on something of this size, 168 dwelling units, I believe we started working with this applicant over two years ago. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's when we started working with them. Um, I remember the pre-application meeting, I believe was at the beginning it was either at the end of 2019 or at the very beginning, like January of 2000, or I'm sorry, at the end of 2018 or at the very beginning of 2019. So the applicant on a 168 unit uh, subdivision, they're in it for the long haul. They have to start meeting with staff years in advance to then basically put a proposal together, get their engineers, their surveyors, their traffic consultants, their planners, uh, their attorneys in this case, um, everybody locked in and loaded and ready to go. So I just say that because it's a process. And so the original um, proposal that they provided to staff was different than what you see tonight. Um, and staff felt that the original propo proposal from the applicant was good, but we felt that there was modifications that needed to happen for staff to feel comfortable with a recommendation of approval. Now, there might be some confusion on that, like, oh, you know, staff should just never recommend anything where we increase the density. In this case, you know, nine units more than the base zoning allows. Or, you know, staff shouldn't, you know, another perception is something like staff shouldn't allow row houses or multifamily. That's all good and well, and I don't disagree with any of that. But if you look at the development code, this is single family residential, so it allows single family homes. The development code that staff is currently working with, whether it's good or bad, has a section for planned unit developments or planned developments. And in that section, as Shelley has pointed out, one of the allowed um, uses is row homes. Another one of the allowed uses is multifamily. And in that section for planned developments, it says all zones in the city of Sandy for residential zones 
have to allow planned developments. So when staff gets an applicant like Mr. Even and all his consultants, we have to basically look at it from that angle is that the code allows for planned developments in this zone. And so we try to work with the applicant to come up with the best thing going forward. And what they've presented tonight is, is a lot different from their original proposal, I will tell you that. So that, that's kind of, I'm just trying to describe kind of the process, how long it is and where we kind of start and stop. Um, if the applicant would have come in with a single family home subdivision with not a PD, um, staff would have probably preferred that just because it would have been a little bit easier to work with from the get-go. Um, however, in saying that, I think we would have lost some really good things that they're actually proposing tonight, um, such as all the open space dedication area. Um, I think we would have lost some of our um, FSH overlay because most single family home developments that aren't done through the PD, um, I want to give Matt credit to this, uh, Mr. Even, that usually as planning commission can attest to and staff can too, those areas are impacted by new lot development. You can see it all over town. So I do think they're doing an excellent job in that regard. They're preserving a ton of urban forestry that we usually don't see to this extent. And so it, it is a balancing act as Shelley pointed out. And as staff, we're kind of dealt, we kind of had to deal with the, the hand we're dealt. And in this case, we were dealt with an applicant that wants to do a plan development, which is within their right to propose by our code. So that, that's kind of why we're here tonight. Staff feels that what they proposed and after working with them for two years is a good proposal. Um, you know, I can see the flip side of that and I sympathize with the existing property owners around there. Um, no doubt about that. Um, so a couple of other things I kind of wanted to point out. This whole area out there, I agree Vista Loop Drive is not a great road. The condition of it's not good. The width of it's not good. There's no, there's no curbs. There's no street lights. I agree with all of that. But the only way, the only mechanism currently in our development code for all that to come up to standards, well, there's two. There's you can lobby the city council and try to get a uh, project, you know, an infrastructure project built out there to get those all brought up to um, code. The other way is for development to occur. So with development, whether this is approved or future subdivisions or land developments approved, that's when things like the roads will be improved, sidewalks will be installed, street lighting will be put in, the road service surface will be um, evaluated and improved. And that kind of to piggyback off that, that's also how utilities and infrastructure work within the city of Sandy. So right now, as most of you probably know on the call, our sewer, our sewer treatment plant is at capacity, our water systems are at capacity, but a way to help actually make those improvements is not just through utility bills, it's through system development charges, which we collect in development. It's also through additional users. So as you see more houses come into the city of Sandy, those houses split the cost and distribution of all those rates. So for sewer rates, water rates, if we were stagnant and we saw no growth, we would still need the sewer treatment plant that's at capacity right now. The problem is, is that all the current rate payers will just be paying more money to get that system constructed. So the only way to make it equitable is to, to continue to increase the population and development within the city limits. Now, I'm not trying to say that what's proposed before you tonight, you know, you, you can have your own feelings on it. The planning commission can recommend to deny it. But what I'm saying is that development needs to occur, not only because it's inevitable, but if we want to see systems like the sewer treatment plant and water plant improved, which we have to do, this is a way to help fund those. The only other thing I wanted to point out is that this whole area, and I sympathize, like I said, with the people that are both in city limits out there and outside of city limits. To me, as a resident of Sandy myself, it really doesn't make much of a difference if you live inside or outside of our city limits. I think of everybody as part of the Sandy community, especially if you're that close in. Um, but what I will say is that whole area out there was always designed, at least for the last um, 23 years since 1997, was designed for urban development. So I'm not saying multifamily, I'm not saying row houses, but I'm saying that entire area out there is within our UGB or urban growth boundary, and it will all be urbanized and developed at some point, whether this proposal is approved or not, somebody else will come with a proposal at some point and you will see more housing out there. That's how uh, Oregon's land use system works. That's how urban growth boundaries work. 
Um, there is sewer already down Vista Loop all the way to our T Street. So it is available and ready in that area. Um, so I just want to point out that that whole area, while I don't disagree with anybody that spoke, Vista Loop is in bad condition. I don't disagree with that. And I don't disagree that if a proposal, this one tonight or another one in the future, won't change the makeup of that area out there. I'm not disagreeing with any of that. But what I am saying is that whole area is slated for development eventually. It's all in the urban growth boundary. Um, so I just want the Planning Commission and the public to keep that in mind is that whether you like it or don't like it, in the state of Oregon, if you buy land in an urban growth boundary, you should be wary or aware that at some point that will be developed um, at a much higher density than in this, what is currently set up out there. So hopefully that made sense. All of that that I just kind of went over, I just wanted to point out some of those facts and some of that information that some people on the call might not be aware of. Um, and that I think summarized what I had. Okay, thank you, Kelly. We will move on to rebuttal from the applicant, Tracy. Yeah, I appreciate those comments from staff. Um, thought they were well, well done. And, uh, you know, we do want to be good neighbors with the neighborhood there. And, you know, as Kelly was mentioning, this area is identified for residential development. There's actually some property just down the road that has medium density designation. So I guess with that, I'd like to recognize Mike Ard real quick to talk about just a little bit on the traffic generation from the site and how it might otherwise be generated with, uh, if it were all single family residential. Are you there, Mike? Kelly will have to unmute him. Is he there? Sorry about that, Tracy. I'm trying to, I'm trying I see to him coming in. I see him coming in, there he is. Oh. Yeah, sorry about that. I was that. attempting to raise my hand so that I could do it from my laptop directly, but you didn't notice me, so. <laughs> can, I lower, can I lower your hand on that one? Yes, you can. Okay, thank you. Uh, so two things that I wanted to raise just in response to the, the comments that I heard. The first is that there were concerns about the levels of traffic associated with the planned PUD and a statement that we shouldn't be allowing more units to be developed within the site than what would be allowed with the single family dwelling. And as has been described by staff, obviously we are allowed a density bonus, but I think there's another point that's being missed there. And that's that the traffic volumes associated with our planned PUD are actually lower than what would be allowed as single family de dwelling development. So the number of homes that can be developed on the property is 159 as single family homes. We're proposing a very slight increase to 168 total dwelling units, almost half of which are going to be multifamily. And those multifamily dwelling units generate far fewer trips than single family homes. And as a result, we will see a reduction in the number of trips to and from this site as compared to what would be allowed under the SFD maximums. Uh, the second point that I wanna make is just to add a little bit of information about that right turn lane discussion and I appreciated the, the comments that were made by staff, as well as the discussion um, among the planning commissioners regarding that issue. What I wanted to, to bring to light is that ODOT established specific clear and objective standards for when a right turn lane is warranted. And we examined those warrants. They come from the Texas Transportation Institute uh, studies of when there's a, a material benefit associated with a right turn lane. And there is a graph that's shown on page 13 of 19 in your supplemental materials that were provided by the applicant because that was one of the pieces that was missed in the original packet. But on page 13 of 19, you'll see a graph that shows the ODOT adopted curve of when a turn lane is warranted. On that curve, you'll see that anytime there are fewer than 20 right turn vehicles in an hour during the design hour, a right turn lane is not warranted. There's also a little exception note that's provided that says if there are more than 700 vehicles in the outer lane during the peak hour and fewer than 20 right turning vehicles, you may need a shoulder improvement. In this case, the volume of traffic that's in that outer lane is less than 500 vehicles. We do not fall within the area where even a shoulder treatment is 
recommended based on the ODOT and Texas Transportation Institute curves. That's not to say that there would be no benefit associated with adding a right turn lane. It's just that there isn't a significant safety benefit as demonstrated statistically by the TTI study, and there isn't a cost benefit analysis that would show that this is an improvement. Uh, and as has been stated previously, we did make the de appropriate determinations regarding what treatments were needed at that location at the time that the right turn slip lane was removed from the site. Those improvements are done, including the pavement widening. And because we are looking at clear and objective standards and you need to make appropriate decisions based on those clear and objective standards, we are referring to ODOT's requirements and their graph, which demonstrate that further improvements are not warranted at this location. So hopefully that makes our position clear with respect to the right turn lane, as well as the volume of traffic there. Thank you. And I don't think we got your uh, name and address. Oh, terribly sorry for that. Mike Ard with Ard Engineering. My address is 17790 Southwest Dodson Drive, Sherwood, Oregon 97140. All right, thanks, Mike. So I guess with that, I don't really have anything else um, in terms of rebuttal. We do, you do have a continuance on the table that was requested, and as Kelly mentioned, you know that needs to be granted. Um, we, if if I, I think the next meeting was identified as December sixteenth, and that is a good date for us if that works all for you and you would like to continue this. So I guess with that, I would just kind of end our rebuttal unless you have any questions for us. Okay. Thank you. And with that, we will hit the pause button on public testimony. And um, let me just do a quick poll of the commissioners. We often take a break at this time. Do you want to take a break? before we come back and address the bigger issues as well as the little ones like continuance. I see one nod, I see one up. Okay, majority rules. We will take, uh, let's say a five minute break and uh, we'll be back. Okay, well, everybody's back that needs to be here and uh, we'll pick up, can we, get the easy part out of the way first with the continuance discussion as Kelly has reminded us um, we have to grant it and the next meeting that was he had held for us was December 16. So M Mr. Or Chair Crosby I just yes. Kelly's gonna smack me in the side of the head for saying this but just to I just want to lay this out there because it's what the law says. You actually have two options. You can continue the hearing or you could just hold the record open and reconvene later to make deliberate and make a decision. Um, but if your preference and practice and habit is to continue, then by all means, we should continue. Describe the difference. How would it look? So one is basically you you leave the record open for more testimony. The question is, do you want to and public testimony in which, and just um, leave the record open for people to submit additional written testimony and argument, and then convene after a few, reconvene after a few weeks, consider all that new information, plus what you heard tonight, plus what's already in the record, and deliberate, make your decision. If you continue it, you leave open the option for more public testimony at that next hearing. So it's really, do you wanna continue the public hearing portion of it or go ahead and close that, leave the record open for written evidence, and then just reconvene in a few weeks to deliberate. Yeah, it's, we, we did that process for Bailey Meadows, um, the other process. And um, while it had a few benefits, I would say the amount of additional staff time and work was not worth it. It was a <laughs> lot of extra work because we had all these clocks every week for three straight weeks, and then we right. had a put all that information together and send it to all the people that had commented and the applicant and the public. It, it, to be honest, it was not, for staff at least, it was not worth the extra effort. 
Fair enough. That's all a good point. I just wanted to make sure that, that you are aware that they're at least under the statutes that you have the two options. That's yeah. why I didn't mention it. Yeah, I'd be more open to the other option. I mean, if that's the direction planning commission ultimately decides to go, that's we'll have to go there, but it would be a really rough time of year in December <laughs> with yeah. um, holidays and stuff for staff to have any additional work. So I, I I would prefer the first option of the traditional public hearing continuance. I mean, between now and then they can still, anybody can still submit then written testimony, right? That's correct. So really yeah. the only, only difference yeah. is, is do you allow oral testimony at the next hearing or not? Yep, that's correct. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't think that's gonna be necessary. I think like we did with Bailey Meadows, we're going to hear very similar testimony to what we already heard today. I think written testimony would probably be enough. But Kelly is correct. It does put a, uh, if we set a schedule for people to submit additional written evidence and arguments, it's a fairly complicated short schedule that he then has to referee and manage for the next few weeks. Um, so it does oh, create additional staff burdens. I'm okay with keeping oh, okay. it. Um, just so we could continuing close it. it today. Go ahead. Yeah, can't close yeah. it today. I agree. Yeah, you can't close it today. You can leave it open so that after today you'd only receive written testimony and then you'd meet again to make it a recommendation to council or you can just have another meeting in next month and we would still receive written testimony and then at that meeting there'd be another probably 30 minutes of public testimony similar to tonight i mean honestly it's way preferred for staff to do it that way the second way either way yeah. you're going to have another meeting the next second way yeah and and it would we're looking at we're only looking at three weeks and two days so it's it's not even a month yeah. that, that we would have to um, craft a pretty tight schedule. I, yeah. I I agree with Hollis in that it would be yeah. it would be nice if all we had to look at additionally was written testimony. But uh, I appreciate Kelly's um, informing us of the yeah. logistical nightmare right. that it creates. Yeah, we do have. Yeah, I appreciate that too. Thank you, Kelly. I would agree. Yeah, the December meeting, you know, we moved up because of uh, they'd be right up kissing next to Christmas, so that does shorten the time. So I'm okay with continuing with going with staff recommendation. Mm -hmm. anybody, anybody else with a comment on that? Uh, Chairman, I also agree with the second option that Kelly presented. Okay. What, what is that date then? The 16th. 16th. A Wednesday night. So Wednesday. Uh, it's a Wednesday. I mean, one, th one thing it does allow, which I do prefer actually, is that one of the people testifying tonight said that they believe that there was a neighbor or two that couldn't make tonight and wanted to testify mm -hmm. verbally. And by allowing them to just testify at the next meeting, it does give those few neighbors that maybe couldn't make it tonight um, one additional time to come and speak before the planning commission. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have to take a vote on that or what, how does that work? Yeah, eventually there would be a motion to continue it to that date. Certain my, um, um, my next question is whether you want to do discussion tonight or hold everything until then. Um, I'm assuming that the applicant, well, no, take, I, do we just pick it up with public testimony at that meeting, Chris? Yes, correct. Correct. And as far as, as discussion among the planning commission tonight, you have probably 80 to 90% of the evidence you're going to hear and, and read. But, you know, that additional 10 to 20% might make a difference, right? So um, I guess my preference would be if you wait until all the evidence is in to have your deliberation. Okay. Jeremy, can we ask a, can we ask a question? Uh, something Shelly presented, can I ask a question of her to get 
maybe put it on the public record sure. for other people that have the same thought. Shelly, when you mentioned the 120 single family resident uh, lots that were out there, um, can you give the public what the difference is between a single family detached and row home uh, when it comes to lot comparison? So I think there were, is it, am I right when I say there's 32 lots um, earmarked for, for, for townhome? And then the, the other difference would be detached? Yes. So um, what we call single family homes um, can be either attached or detached homes. So detached homes are what we think of as just a house, right? Um, uh, an attached home is something like a townhouse or a row house. I guess you call them row houses here. Um, so 32 of those lots are going to be attached row houses. Um, each row house occupies a single lot. Um, the detached single family homes, there are 39 plus 49, 88 single, detached single family homes. Um, so just regular houses. And then two lots for multifamily homes. So each one of those lots is gonna have its own apartment building and each apartment building is gonna have 24 units. So that's a total of 48 multifamily units, um, but on two lots. Does that, does that clarify that? Charlie, it's perfect for me. I just wanted to make sure the public knew what the difference was in the yeah. single family lot was. So. Yeah, sometimes I forget that like, um, talking about like detached or attached homes, it doesn't make a lot of intuitive sense. Thank well, that, that and also uh, when we talk about lots, right. uh, a normal, or I would, I would say that the general thinking of a lot is a piece of land that has one house on it. We don't think of a lot as being a huge thing that mm -hmm. has 24 apartments on it. So mm -hmm. the, there can be confusion there where you say one lot has 24 apartments. It's just uh, it's kind of a different thought. Can I, can I add one more wrinkle to all this? Sure, Kelly. One that occurred to me last night for some random reason. I know I'm a land use nerd thinking of this kind of stuff on a Sunday night. Um, so one thing I do want everybody to keep in mind is that moving forward in the future, once House Bill 2001 is adopted and our zoning ordinance is different, um, as we discussed, I think it was a month or two ago, in all practicality, single family home zoning in Oregon in, po in cities of population of 10,000 greater is over. And it's gonna be over at the end of this June coming up, June, 2021. And so I'm not trying to sway the planning commission to go one way or another on the recommendation for the views PD. But what I do wanna point out, and I wanna point it out to the public as well, is that the larger the lot size, so if we allow a lot of lots around 7,500 to 8,000 square feet, there's going to be more potential in the future for more duplexes. So one thing you do want to keep in mind with like the Views PD, for example, they're proposing a lot of lots smaller than 7,500 for single family homes. And on a lot of those lots, you know, around 4,000 to 5,000 square feet for all intents and purposes, it's going to be very hard to convert those into a duplex. I mean, it could be done, but I will say if a lot of those lots, especially the ones abutting the highway, um, that are probably not the most desirable out of all the lots in the subdivision. If you keep a lot of those lots at 7,500 square feet, I think the end result will potentially be that you still have about the same amount of units. Because instead of 5,000 or 4,000 square foot lots with a single family home, I think you'll see a lot of 7,500 square foot homes or lots with duplexes um, to make everything pencil. I think that's what we're going to be seeing more in the future. I'm not saying that will happen with this development, but I'm just letting everybody know on the call, including the public, that as House Bill 2001 comes into play, the, you know, starting in 2021, the larger lot sizes won't always mean that it's just one single family home. So I just wanna keep everybody's kind of on, you know, if there's 159 lots potentially on this acreage, that means that once House Bill 2001 is passed, that that means there's the potential capacity for what is that 318 units. Kelly, Kelly I wanted to ask you a question on that 159. Isn't, isn't that already passed? No, no. Go ahead, Ron. I'm sorry, 
Kelly, I want to ask you a question on that. Has it been already? Oh, go ahead. It's a big delay, Hollis, so we can't tell if you're speaking. That's <laughs> the problem. Okay. Uh, that's because I live too far out. Um, what I was going to ask Kelly was, hasn't that already passed? It's just going to be enacted next June? The House oh, yes. bill? The House bill has already been passed. The code language specific to Sandy right. will be passed in 2021. For the callers on the line and the listeners, if the city of Sandy chooses not to pass anything in the first half of 2021, we will be forced by the state of Oregon to adopt the Oregon model code, which will mean on July 1st of 2021, our code will be following the Oregon model code. So either way, it's going to be passed in Sandy by July 1st, 2021. That all single family home lots can have duplexes on them. Yeah, and if you think about it, 7,500, if you split that in half, you know, what do you get? 3,750, right? So either you have a 3,750 square foot lot, which some of those that are in the lower, or it's gonna be the upper are, and that's what Kelly is saying. You could determine a 7,500 square foot lot, but a duplex, the net result is you're gonna have the same number of single family homes. You'll just have a little space between them. Yeah, and like I said, I'm not trying to persuade anybody either way. I'm just trying to point out that starting next year, we might have an entirely different discussion of um, subdivision development in the SFR or R1 zones, uh, since everything will be able, be able to have a duplex. And as long as Kelly brought it up, uh, I doubt that already built neighborhoods will automatically double in density, although that's what the law allows, right? You can put a duplex wherever there's a single family. Uh, it probably won't double, but if you're going to get that many dwellings, you've got to make sure your your sewer lines and water lines and roads are there to handle it. So you've got to be thinking about infrastructure as all this moves forward in light of House Bill 2001. I hope you will uh, make that statement to the city council. <laughs> they have the power to, to have Sandy, quote, grow up. We're 12,000 square feet now. We can't be our hand and head in the sand anymore and just you know, let things go. So, I mean, that, it's not a, and all that costs money, you know. Kelly, I would like to ask you the staff a question. I'm trying to look at this or get some more information and to help me to look at this correctly. So as I understand it, going through my reading, there's 21 acres of quote, buildable land that's there is that correct i think between the upper and lower shelly would know anyway, shelly's going to know the numbers way better than me <laughs> well even what that is if if because one of the i want to say have problems with it the applicant to get the number on here that they have they've been able to adjust setbacks and lot widths etc to come up with it that number all right I was just trying to figure out is duplexes or not, if they were all at least 7,500 square foot lots, what could I get on there? You, you follow me? So they were all at least 7,500 square feet. Yeah, I mean, if we, yeah, if a lot of them, so as I pointed out earlier, what's gonna then happen is if most of them are 7,500 square feet or all of them are, then we're gonna see a lot more impacts to the FSH area and the forested areas, because that's how they're going to get a lot of that lot area, as we've seen in other developments. Well, they can't develop in the fish overlay. So. Yeah, they can. They just can't. They just can't develop in the restricted development portion of the fish overlay. So there is an area of the fish overlay that they're choosing not to develop in. That under our zoning code, they would be allowed to be able to, be able to develop. Well, yeah. I think. I think the question I'm asking is kind of at the crux for me at least, and maybe where the discussion is. So by doing that, by not stepping into those boundaries and providing the, um, I'm looking at my notes here, the, the open open spaces and the, the, nice, the great things they've done. Okay, I'm not really disputing that. I'm just kind of coming back and trying to figure out, does it allow kind of carte blanche to change the street width, setbacks, et cetera, on our, standard lots because these are there's no standard lots 
um, on it. And I'm just going back to, I think it was Mr. Olson who lived on our key street said, just, you know, we know what's going to happen. So can you make it a little more livable for me? And that's what I'm trying to again, wrestle with, because I thought about the same thing. They could make them all duplexes and have, you know, and do that and be fine. And maybe, I mean, maybe that's better than having these little lots with houses, you know, where you can almost touch the houses at each side. I don't know. But I'm trying to figure out that density question. And it's, again, because they're not touching this and they got this, then you can go to a 4,000 square foot lot and they're, what was it, in Sandy Bluff 6 or whatever, 6? <laughs> when we had them so tight that we came back and we increased it. And now we're like, okay, now we can, it's, this makes I did the, can... I did the arithmetic, Ron. If you just want to do the simple arithmetic and take that and, you know, it works out to 122. That, that's just simple division of 21 acres at 7,500 square feet. You're going to get 122. Now, if you could, if they would fit, who knows, you know, that's all based on the site. Etc. And if you put duplexes on all of them, you know, I guess you get to be 244. That'd be some outside number. That's just simple, wild arithmetic. But I think you're getting to a place where I, I guess, Jerry, I like to suggest we go because um, I, I suggest we don't have too much discussion on it tonight. And the main reason is, um, yeah. from, even from the last one we did, we continued it. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, they heard the 80% of the testimony. I agree with that. But then they kind of gave their first impressions. We came back and a lot of people change their first impressions to something different. So uh, my point, my concern is the same as, as Ron's. PD is new. I'm trying to figure out what our decision space is. And so what I'd like is a discussion from, from Kelly and Chris and um, you know, Shelly, et cetera, on, um, you know, we can just say approve it or not, but, and it's going to council, but if it's, if they, if you, depending on how you interpret the code, if if uh, it, does it make any difference or not? Is my point. In other words, uh, do do the underlying uh, setbacks, for example, and lot widths and stuff in the SFR, do they apply at all? Or do do any of the setbacks or widths in apply you know at all in it? Um, so. Um, you know, like, can we recommend, no, that they have seven and a half feet versus five feet on the side widths? I mean, does it make any difference? Does it have any teeth to it? Can we, can we make that a condition? So that's what I want to, I'm trying to understand so that when, so we can just focus on that, um, the, uh, what our decision space is. Yeah, I have, you know, I had a kind of a similar thought that looking at these questions that we were directed to, I wasn't sure how to handle. I mean, what if they're all these questions, so I, I'm not sure, are we supposed to take a, uh, would we take a vote on each one so that we hand to uh, city council that, yes, we agree with this one, but we do not recommend permitted grow houses in SFF's zoning and yes, we, we, you know, multifamily, so forth. Well, what, what does that mean? Uh, yeah, what difference does it make? Yeah, where, where does it go from there if we have all these split, split votes on all these questions? I, the, I don't intention, know. the intention was to get a temperature or a read so the city council knows the direction you're giving them. Because if you just say approve or deny, but you don't give any additional recommendations on the quantitative adjustments or the variances or when the parks fee in lieu gets paid or when, you know, when the tentative plots expire for the different phases, I think there's just too many things open. So we were trying to direct your decision-making since you're not making a decision, we're trying to make sure that whatever recommendation you give can kind of hit all these main subjects and give the council a good feel for, what level of uh, recommendation you're willing to go with on this? Yeah, but if one, let me give an example. On B, let's say we, you know, because we have row homes. Let's say the, the planning commission votes that we don't want row homes. Does the city council have the authority to disapprove of the PD 
because it has row homes? Or yes. does the applicant yes, have the right to propose those because of the what you've cited that's in the PD code? Correct, both. So if you want to recommend that row homes and multifamily shouldn't be allowed, you can certainly do that. And I think that would be something good for the city council to know from the planning commission. However, that being said, if that's the final recommendation and council decides to deny the planning, to deny the PD, and here's the reason why, because they don't want row homes or multifamily, it's gonna to have to be tied to the code criterion. So you can't, it can't just be like nilly willy, we don't like this proposal, we're gonna deny it. It has to be tied to the code and there has to be specific reasons for why you are uh, recommending the denial. Right, and is there any place in the code where I would find that? I don't know, that's, that's up for you guys. Yeah, we had this conversation already. I, you know, staff is recommending approval. So I don't think we would highlight areas in the code where we think are good areas to recommend denial based on. Well, why wouldn't you be fair and tell us all the reasons why we shouldn't do it and why we should do it, I see even though it you have a recommendation. Yeah, that's not really our role though. Let's give Hollis. Thank you. Um, so a couple of things, I feel like we were talking about whether or not we were gonna discuss this tonight and without agreeing to do that, it's being discussed. So if we're going to discuss it, or if we're gonna talk any more about townhouses, then I wanna be able to give my two cents. So if we're gonna talk about that tonight, then we should decide to talk about it. And if not, we should stop talking about it. You're right. Before we I, go there, I, I huh? Yeah, well, I'm, not try I'm not trying to talk about it. I'm trying to get our decision space understood from staff. I just used that, Hollis, as an example. I could have picked any one of these 20 questions uh, as an example. But if, if Kelly feels that is not their role to find out in the code, which they know much better than I do, where issues might be positive or negative, then we need to have a bigger discussion within what that role is because yeah, I didn't, I did not, I did I did not, not feel that. good about being told if you don't like this, go chase the code Carl and find something. I did not I'm not going to do it for you. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Let's let Hollis finish. Here, here. Thank you. Um, so I, I just wanted to make one comment to the public, because I, I really heard their, their concerns and their fear and their pain, um, and we understand that. I, I, one of the people testifying said, we can't stop you, referring to the Planning Commission, from doing what you're going to do. And I just want to clarify that the Planning Commission isn't here to promote or deny development. We're, we're all volunteering. It takes a lot of time and, and the growth is going to happen. And that the planning commission is your, is your community neighbors. We're your neighbors and, and people you know. And we're doing this because the development's gonna happen anyway. And we're trying to do what is the best interest of our community. That's why we're here. And we, it's our job to um, to follow the codes that already exist and to interpret them. It's not to make them up. So I just wanted to say that to the community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, and, and then I guess my other thing is if we're not going to discuss it tonight, then I really want to um, encourage my fellow commissioners to go out and look at the property if you don't have a good sense of it. It backs up right to Johnson RV. And I think that part of the process of deciding what I noticed is that the that part of the part of it, like the row houses or whatever, are right up against the Johnson RV. So I think that that's part of the thinking in terms of what's going to be what's going to be acceptable on the lot and how it's going to be developed. What I see is the big homes near the edge with the best view and the row homes with their backyard against Johnson RB. So mm -hmm. just for what that's worth, I think it's worth a look. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Hollis. What, 
then what we will be doing, if I can, when we meet again, three weeks and two days, um, we will no doubt be focusing our attention on these questions in the, um, the final pages of the staff report. It's going to be kind of a different um, pass off to city council than we have sometime done in the past where uh, depending upon our take on some of these points, they may, they, we may be tossing them a lot of work to do. And I, I'm not saying that as an excuse. It's just, it's just my experience with the oftentimes when we pass along recommendations, um, they kind of go there and we're not adding a lot of work. So we will be passing along a recommendation that will look at the, the preponderance of our feelings on these questions as to whether it's a, a recommendation to um, approve or deny. And, and we'll be looking at those questions and to, to give the council our feeling of having looked at some of these, um, I, I agree, I struggle with them because they, they're like dominoes. And if I don't agree with one, it's just, it, it, it affects five others. And it's gonna be, it's gonna be a challenge, but uh, you guys are up for it. And, and Jerry, um, if I can, <clears throat> we may in terms of next meeting in terms of trying to have everybody come out unanimous we may come up with a just a voting on each one um, as opposed to trying to be in a jury room and convince the other uh one juror to change their vote you know what i'm saying yeah um, yeah so just, and with and with, with, with hollow we'll have and, a discussion yeah yeah yeah, we will, we will have a discussion and I, I, I suppose, and Chris or Kelly can, can help me here, that we're not obligated to pass it on to city council with a definite we approve or a definite we don't approve, that we could pass it to them as it's now yours, here are our concerns reflected in our responses to these questions. Is that an option for us? That's exactly what we're looking for you to do. Okay. Okay, so that's helpful. That is helpful to know that we're not we're not sitting here with two stamps that are approved or denied that we're going to stamp on it and pass it along. Well, just a reminder that the last question, Chair, does ask us a uh, question. R asks us, do we yeah. grant approval for for the views? So ultimately, the the final question does ask that. <laughs> yeah, I so I'll, I'll take a problem. We're not that. sure. <laughs> So one thing that's that's been brought up in the past is that, you know, when we bring these things to you and they're just recommendations to forward along, it looks like it's already kind of decided with all the conditions and everything written. That's what we were trying to avoid here is basically say, here's all the conditions throughout the staff report. If you want to refer back to them, they're in bold. Here are the crux. Here are the main issues, though, and we need your guys' input on them to then forward a recommendation to City Council of approval or denial for the, for the views PD. Because if you say yes, 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 yes on all the recommendations, then that's an approval of the PD. And if it's continually no, 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 you need to find reasons for why those are no's. And I know Don doesn't like my answer to that, but our recommendation is to approve it. So of course we're not going to have a whole bunch of reasons why to deny it in the staff report. I well, think uh, where, Kelly, where, this, where this is going is a, a shift in paradigm a little bit to more of a um, advisory role um, as an advisory commission you're advising the city council on some of the important considerations and things they might want to focus in on because you've already looked at it right you can save the city council time because you've already thoroughly vetted the proposal and you can advise them on the things that they need to consider above you know, and so they don't get dragged down into the weeds or whatever but rather than a straightforward prove or deny serve as an advisory function to the city council That'd be a that'd be a nice thing to do, but that's not what's going to happen. Well, well I'd be a little optimistic about how yeah. we proceed. Yeah, we'll we'll see. I think it I think it can. It is a different. It is a paradigm difference, and that's a helpful uh, word picture because uh, we are used to looking at all the little details and making definitive 
authoritative decisions on them. And such is not the case with this. And um, we need to uh, be able to roll with that. I mean, I've, I've heard loud and clear from Mr. Lasowski and other members that they would like to be a review body and like to look at larger picture things. This is kind of the opportunity for that. We're not asking you like, oh, should the pipes be sized at eight inches for a sewer line? Of course they should, that's the public works standard. So instead of kind of looking at things like that, we are trying to ask you the bigger picture topics, the things that I don't think there is a right or wrong answer to. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if I can, I like the way you phrase up the questions at the end, okay? I'm sorry we didn't get to them tonight. Um, and all the effort that has gone into this, it's obvious there's a lot of work and a lot of detail put into it. I, I guess when you come up and you see that, and if you're especially the public, it's like, well, it's already done. It's locked in, right? When you see that much detail to it. And it's not. I was trying to ask the question. Hall asked, gave us a little uh, project, which I think homework to do, which is go up and visit the site and see how it actually plays into it. I was trying to ask a question a little bit earlier, more to staff of, in terms of homework, because I really am, think for me, it's a crux of what we're dealing with is how much latitude because this is a uh, SFR as it stands right now, but given that it goes to PD, how much latitude or how much how how much flexibility do you get to it because it's a PD? You know, now you now you stamp it and call it a PD, and you put in some of these things. Then you get to do what? How far does that go? What can you change around on it? Um, and I wouldn't say I'm struggling, but yeah, I mean we, because. We as a review board for acceptance, we're looking at number of feet, lengths of this, number of these on it, okay? And then when I go through, that's what I struggle with is, it doesn't fit into those modes, molds that we have, and I'm just not sure how much latitude, because it's a PD, it, it should be given, so. Well, that, those will be good things for us, I believe, when we meet to uh, discuss and to get into the record to city council. Yeah, but I, I think Ron's asking a question that um, I think if Mr. Crean is willing to put together a little memo um, to be included with the next staff report, I think that would be a way to answer Mr. Lasowski's questions of, you know, where do you have the authority to um, say no to something just because you don't like the idea of it or where do you have to find basically criterion that they're not meeting to say no to it? I think that's what you're kind of getting. Yeah. 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 No, Thank you. Yeah. So I, I think, I think if uh, Mr. Crean will, uh, if he's open to it, I think a little memo from the city attorney's office, that'd be certainly a better avenue to do that than from me or Shelley. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly. And in saying that, is there anything else you want to see different? Cause I mean, what we're going to do is give a revised staff report. But all the revised staff report will probably do is include all those additional exhibits that were posted after the 16th, unless there's something else you want us to look into further or something else you want us to do different for the revision. Actually, I liked the way that you did it this time. I thought it was really helpful. Any other comments? Can I say just one last thing? I know sure. we're beating a dead horse, but um, I think just kind of keeping on this kind of 10,000 foot level before you know we meet again and kind of get into the nitty gritty details. Um, just thinking about something good to stew on um, until that next meeting is what kind of fundamentally a planned development is, right? So instead of the way that a planning commission usually operates, which is saying, here's the request, does it meet the code requirements? If so, then approve. If it doesn't meet the code requirements, then deny, right? Things that are very objective and cut and dry. Um, a planned development is kind of the opposite of that, right? It's very, it's inherently subjective. It's about form and design and compatibility as opposed to, you know, does it meet rule X, Y, and Z, right? And so I think just kind of keeping that in mind about um, thinking about a plan development as a holistic thing, um, I think is something important to, to, to consider. Mm -hmm. 
it is it is a new paradigm for us. Yeah. Mr. Crosby, we want to make sure you get a a, a motion if you're going to continue. Yes. Yep. I would just. Can I ask one more question? I promise it won't be long. <laughs> um, this is probably more for Kelly um, or or Shelley. And I don't know why I haven't asked this before in other meetings. The the presentation that you all give when you're you know, the PDF or the PowerPoint is that public record? Is that yeah. available for viewing? Because it's not in it's not ever in our packages. Is it somewhere on the website? Um, usually because I finish it the morning of um, planning commission meeting because we're always getting new information, new public comments. Um, but it's public record. It's absolutely something I can supply to each of okay. you. Like, so if, I, if, I, if I want to review it, I could just ask for it. Yeah. Okay. It'll be, it'll be included in the next uh, planning commission packet as well as an exhibit. We're also, we're also going to try something different with the next meeting um, as a suggestion came in tonight is that the staff report will be separate from all the rest of the exhibits so that it doesn't take so long to download. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we're, gonna, we're gonna try to work on some stuff like that, but it's just, it's kind of a hard thing, like where do you break the exhibits up by, but we'll try our best yeah. next meeting with that. Well, I think yeah. if we as, as planning commissioners were all uh, provided with a one gig service by, uh, by uh, SandyNet, um, we wouldn't have any problem downloading anything. We, <laughs> well, you can make the request. <laughs> oh, but I'll tell you what, I actually do it and I pay for it. I'm giving, and I'm not going to complain because I hardly ever get one gig. In fact, I get, don't even get a hundred megs. <laughs> okay. Another issue. <laughs> Let me see. Uh, Todd, you're, you're stepping off after the next meeting. And uh, John will be at the next meeting. So we will give you the opportunity to make the motion that we continue this to December 16 and wrap it up for the evening. Is that okay? Uh, are, are you God, what an honor. honor. <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll make a motion. I move that we continue this um, public hearing to December 16th. I'll second that. I second it. Okay, it's been, motion has been made, seconded, and thirded um, to continue this meeting to December 16th, 2020. All in favor, I, let's do a roll call. Just, yep. Oh, a thumbs up will work? Okay, Chris says a thumbs up will work. In favor, say aye. I or so Aye. Us. Aye. I see I see nothing but thumbs. Motion pass. We will see you in December. I have nothing else. I don't see anything else on the agenda other than number eight, which begins with the letter A. Who wants to handle that? Yeah, at the at the next meeting, Chair Crosby will probably only have the approval of the minutes and this agenda item. I don't really plan on doing like a director's report in two and a half weeks or whatever it is. That'll be good. I think we'll be anxious to just jump into it. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. I moved that we adjourn. I'm waiting for. I'm, well, I, I moved heard, that I heard we the adjourn. Oh, I second that. <laughs> Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we adjourn. All in favor, give us a thumbs up. Unanimous. Unanimous. We are adjourned. See you all next uh, next month, and do have a safe and uh, blessed Thanksgiving. You too, Jerry. Yeah, you too. You too. Happy holidays, everyone. Yeah, everybody. Bye -bye.